Let's get kicking and uh, get ourselves underway. Welcome everyone to the Australia Microsoft 365 Adoption User Group for April. Excited to have you all here as always. Lots to go through throughout the day. The link to the presentation and the YouTube channel is actually available in chat. So I've pinned it into the chat so you should be able to see all that content is there for you. The recording does go live at the end. I will put it up into my YouTube channel. If you wish to, you should be able to use the QR code even to be able to grab the presentation. So it is there, everything that we go through, because there's always a ton of content as well as so many links to so many different things. So um, appreciate you all coming along for the journey yet again, those that continue to come back. So let's get ourselves underway. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting from today and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples that we have along with us. So I ask that we all be welcoming, open to all questions and viewpoints, especially when we get into a fireside chat. You know, great with a fireside chat, we've got to plug it all into chat and, you know, hit us with whatever it is that we need. So I, you know, appreciate that, you know, we're always on a learning journey that, you know, we have to be kind and understanding of all of our differences in the way that we tackle it. Plus, don't forget to be very friendly in regards to some of the gifts and considerate of others when we are in chat. Happy to have gifts, but let's just keep them nice. Okay. If you're not familiar with me, if you are new along to the user group, my name is Kirsty McGrath. Um, I have OnPoint Solutions. I am a adoption consultant. I'm a trainer. I'm a user experience specialist. I'm an employee experience specialist. It's a, it's always a bit of a mouthful. I've um, been running the user groups for eight years and now what have I been up to? We always start with a bit of a what have I been up to? I was over recently at the Microsoft MVP Summit. It was so exciting. If anyone had seen my um, LinkedIn post, I might have you know, gone, I'm so looking forward to this. The thing that I love about going to MVP Summit is we we get to be around all those that are passionate and we get to really you know get in and ideate it's that creation to keep us going for the next year it was always it was always a um, a wonderful time so i'm going to go through some of the you know what did we get up to so Here's my name on the wall. It is. It's around about here on the wall. <laughs> so I'm one of the very many on the wall around the globe and very privileged to be part of the community. But I've had some pretty cool geek out moments. I got invited. There was only two MVPs. It was Heather and myself that went to the Microsoft OneNote 20th birthday. And I got to meet the founder of OneNote, so the founder and the VP and spend a bit of time. So I got to have some time with founders and you know me I'm a cake decorator so it's like the, the EA Aaron was like how am I going to cut a cake for this many people and of course everyone kind of pointed to me going she knows how to like design them decorate them cut them <laughs> so I ended up having to um I didn't have to but I ended up cutting up the 20th birthday cake for everyone there so that was very cool and I got to hear the full story around the origination of OneNote where it came from to the you know some of the ideation as to why and the naming that they went through and of course this is his poor shit it's like he got the one note and he put the one note um license plate on so that he could get free promotion so as he's going around and and across the bridge in seattle he said about a thousand people will get to see this every day and i could do some free promotions of one note <laughs> pretty cool and some fabulous people that I got to hang out with and um, faces that you might recognize from all around the globe. A lot of people that have actually been in and been amazing presenters, even within this group. Um, up the very top here, here are some of our Aussie MVPs, Aussie actually and New Zealand ANZ MVPs across the um, Asia Pacific. So it was great to hang out with them. We had a women in teams night, which was just Fabulous. It was so fun hanging out with those guys. My collab team that we do the recordings that I've talked about all of the time. So spent a bit of time with some um, great people. Then had a bit of a touristy fun, got out there, got to the markets, had a bit of fun going and seeing Clippy. He's still alive. <laughs> I went to the museum. I got to hang out in the um, tree house. They're actually meeting rooms at Microsoft. You can see it's not a bit of an angel. And of course, I got home and my cat had Misty, uh, Velcro and, you know, all, all over me. And in my cake decorating over on the far right hand side, this is my uh, soon to be son-in-law's 
33rd birthday cake that I made him. But first I decided the whole top tier should actually collapse to the floor in a big heap. So I had to redo it. Mm. <laughs> so my cake decorating days. But let's get in and get underway because I know that Heather has a bit of a hard stop because she's got to get underway. And I could see that she's calling from her car. So we'll have some fun as long as you drive safe, Heather. But I'd just like to read out back in the day, this was some time ago now, you know, Heather and I um, got together this is when I really first got to um, know Heather, you know, very well. I was episode number 99 in the uh, Mavens Do It Better, the Tech Maven, where I got interviewed on my journey to being an MVP. A little bit about um, me. It was a bit about um, what makes me tick and why I do what I do. So if you actually want to hear a bit more about me and my journey, please feel free. It was a, it was a while ago. <laughs> Back in 2020, I think it was in COVID. Heather, if I remember rightly. Yeah, back a while. So our very special guest speakers, this is over at the MVP Summit with me hanging out with Caruana and Heather. Um, it was so fabulous to sit down with them and I had a bit of a chat and I wanted to bring them in to do a fireside chat because in the adoption space, we're seeing so much happening here, especially at the moment. Um, so, you know, I really wanted to try and make sure that as part of this, we we sat down and had a bit of a talk. So Caruana is the principal manager in the Microsoft customer um, customer group and in the advocacy group, if I remember right, let me get that one word right. These guys, I mean, Heather's been working really hard in this space and, you know, really a kudos to her. Because, you know, the adoption piece was so far behind for so very, very, very many years at Microsoft and her coming together and pulling it all and giving us a site that we can actually work with and, you know, and us as MVPs can also provide feedback on to try and get it to a place where it will support us as communication managers and training managers and analysts and um, adoption specialists, employee experience specialists. There's so many of us that are actually out there across this space um, that I do appreciate. And Heather is new to the group, but not new to um, neither Microsoft. And she was an MVP. So we met back in the MVP day. So the fact that she's now out there and uh, going hard in the space, fabulous. So welcome, ladies. I'll get you coming in you. and I'll just put you on spotlight. So let's spotlight you all hey thank you now. thank you so much that was just a wonderful introduction i appreciate you so no, much thank you no um and as i said you know having this space and having the kind of support that we need and not to feeling like we're on our own is really important I think Heather and I would agree with that. It's all about community and, you oh, yeah. know, whatever whatever we can do to to help everyone is is just important. And it happens to be both of our passions, right? Um, you know, I love technology, but I love people more. And so I tend to focus on the human side of change most definitely. I still like being a business solution architect, but that's always ultimately about helping people. So um, yeah. hey, Heather, since you are the mobile of the two of us, um, <laughs> sure. I, <Very> thought, <laughs> yeah. I thought you might want to go first with your awesome stuff about MGCI, and then I can be a little more long-winded about all the adoption stuff that yeah. might work out, because I, I know you have a hard stuff, too. User enablement. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Jamie. She's got my brain. User yeah. enablement. And don't forget, anyone yes. has Yay. any questions. <laughs> Any questions at all, please put yeah. them into chat. I'm keeping an eye out on chat for the team. So if you've got a question you want to ask along the way, um, please put it in. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I will be able to look at that here in a second too. So yeah, well, so, I'll, read no, it out for super... you, <laughs> I'll read it out. Yeah, no, it's all good. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, super excited, first of all, to be um, with y'all down under, as we say, um, and Chris, Chris, oh, you're just amazing, first of all. So the wheel Thank behind you. you um, oh, everybody, yes, you all know about the wheel. I mean, the, I, I the wheel of fortune. I didn't realize how famous it was, guys, until I got over to it's MVP so Summit and um, people were wanting to take photos <laughs> with me. So all over the world. Yes. And um, yeah, I was I'm very humbled. <laughs> uh, it's so awesome. No, I just it would do, do so many good things. And so and also thank you to all of you, you know, like these wonderful you know user groups are where it's at for where we are right now in the world right so it's like it's just so fun and cool to be a part of uh, the conversation so thank you for doing that with us and 
with that, I'm going to pull in right here because I can drive and fireside chat at the same time. And now I'm going to sit and, and talk while, to you. While Heather's, so, while Heather's that. doing that, I'm going to tell you Done. that Heather actually has been in the Microsoft ecosystem for a very, very long time. She started playing with SharePoint at one of the original versions of it, Tahoe, back in the day. Yes. And I had the pleasure of having Heather on my team um, as, a, as a vendor, yeah. as a supplier at the beginning of COVID. And she and I were in the trenches together in those first months yeah. of COVID um, that were so intense. And she helped uh, me actually teach the world how to run virtual events uh, because our team became the virtual yeah. event team. Um, and she's just done so much amazing work. And then she went on and worked for the business applications group and just did so much fantastic work over there at the Power Platform Conference and really bringing their community together. And, you know, I'm a fan of Heather's. And so um, I'm so lucky that wow. she has now joined our team um, to help us across <laughs> M365 and Copilot because my job changed and I have all of M365 yeah. now and Copilot as well. And I needed some seasoned, amazing help. And she was so <laughs> lovely She'll give you to that. say yes. <laughs> yes. And now Thank she's you. leading yeah, up all awesome. of our Microsoft Global Community Initiative work, which she's going to tell you about. But I just wanted to to give a little spiel there about Heather's capabilities, because y'all are going to see a lot of her as she's doing all this work around the global community. And um, she is an absolute, um, you know, champion for the cause of community, for user groups, for user enablement, for really the human side of this, right? And I think that um, she and I have a lovely Venn diagram between our different backgrounds, but certainly community yeah. and production and human talk, not acronym speak, yes. um, are some of the things that we both share. So with that, I'll let you go. You got parked. Right. That was enough fill in time. Yes, so that thank you. Can you. Get I'm parked. parked. <laughs> I'm good. Yes, dear. Thank you. You know, yeah, I know. I was like, oh, how am I going to work this out? And I was like, we did because we can multitask. That's what we do. That's so right. thank you for that. Yeah, no, it's super exciting to be um, in this space you know, just having the all over, you know, from Power Platform and Dynamics 365 back from the, yeah, the old the old days of SharePoint and now with Microsoft 365. So, yeah, so the, and these user groups are just where it's at. So thank you for pulling all of these things together. And um, yeah, for right now, for Microsoft Global Community Initiative, because we love our acronyms, MGCI, uh, Carolyn and I put our heads together, you know, after I started and and, and, and building on a lot of the th things that she had already done in community with user enablement and all of that, um, we really went back to Jeff Tiefer, who is the president of Collaborative Apps and um, Platforms, and then Charles Lamana, who is a uh, corporate vice president over on the biz app side, and said to them, hey, you know, we really want to look at a one Microsoft community motion and how can we do more of that? And so it was between us and our divisions, but also then uh, with Power BI and Fabric, with Azure and with others, you know, we started with a community council internally, which still exists. And there's about 500 people in that. And so we talk amongst ourselves, the global MVP community folks and people from developer marketing and folks from even Xbox and all of that. And we talk a lot internally. And then we thought, ooh, how about an external larger community? And so we launched that about a year and a half ago. And it has, you know, a general meeting that we have once a month. There's a board of community folks that were um, nominated and voted in. We also have regional leaders, uh, which we're going to announce uh, a big onslaught of more of those this week as well. So it's really led, run by the community with, you know, infrastructure and support by us, uh, Microsoft. Microsoft. Um, and so, you know, it's really, really um, been fun and then also looking at events um, and that with COVID you know moving everything from you know the the in-person to digital and now it's like you know we're kind of moving back uh, from hybrid and into more in-person events and so a lot of folks are like hey you know I want to start something in my community or you know there was all of these like old SharePoint Saturdays and Dynamics 365 or a hackathon and maybe they're not there and we want to bring them back so we're doing a lot of teaching and training for new event producers, but also folks who are like, you know, I'm going to dust this playbook off and see what's up and I want to do something. And so, you know, we're hosting training on the fourth Thursday of the month 
Um, how do you sessionize? What's this event break thing? How do you get sponsors? You know, um, how do you build a budget? You know, what do you do for marketing? Um, this last week, we had a lessons learned where we had um, Emily Mancini and Lauren LeFou on from the Community Days Miami that they just did um, in this last February. People, uh, we had tons of people and people were like, oh my God, because they had so much goodness around how to do marketing and, you know, all of their best practices and templates. And we're going to gather all that stuff up and we're going to share them. All of this is about sharing knowledge, like usual in the community, right? But it's like, why not take those templates and best practices and all of that and put them together in playbooks like we did, like I got the chance to do with Caruana during COVID um, for the virtual event playbook. And we're working on an in-person and hybrid playbook right now too, pulling from everybody in the community's best practices and putting them in one place through that MGCI motion. Um, and once you do sign up, which you all should, it's aka.mswac MGCI sign up. Very easy um, <laughs> to get to get. And I'm sure we'll get that in the chat. But you know, once you sign up, we put you in the community tenant and the Microsoft community tenant. And I'll shout out Carolina because what she did during COVID is she was like, we need a place for all this stuff. And so she went to the powers that be that Microsoft and said, hey, can we get this? Because, you know, things cost money, right, um, to host. And so she had that set up. And that has been the place for user groups for all of these different events. And heck, it ran a lot of the first party flagship events on the back end during COVID kind of behind the scenes as well. And it's a playground for us in many ways where we get to try out new products and put them in the community tenant for all of you who are a part of it to try it out. So you get put into that tenant, into the teams for community organizers. You're invited to all the meetings. You get to get all the templates. You get a newsletter. Oh my goodness, it's fun. So, you know, I encourage you to sign up and be a part, um, share your ideas, share your best practices, let your voices be heard, love running this. Um, and now in this new role back over in M365, it's part of my charter to really run this along with Tiffany Lee, who's been doing an amazing job for the last year doing um, the general session meetings. And so we're getting together and collaborating on how we can just continue to dream about what this thing can be and what you all want, because it's for and, you. Um, can I ask, you know, Heather, I know that for our, yeah. you know, for those that are in our Aussie time zone, it can be a real challenge because we get mm -hmm. a lot of these. It's actually at one, two, three o'clock in the morning, um, like yeah. having the champs calls as much as a lot of us would like to join. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's not difficult. It can be difficult. So, I mean, yeah. each month I put up the information around, you know, what mm -hmm. it was, the recording and sure. the download. So that's in a, in a slide. Well, we have the same thing in that community area where we can go to to watch it a little later because it's not always so easy for Absolutely. some of us. Absolutely. Yeah, we run the calls at 8 a.m. Pacific and 5 p.m. Pacific. And so we do try and catch both time zones. 5 p.m., we might be right. Yeah, 5 p.m. Yeah. yeah, so most of the calls um, we're doing two time zones. And if we're not, we, we're going we're gonna to start. So for sure. Yeah, because it's important because we like to catch y'all you know, at a time when you're not like, well, there's, there's, there's nothing know? like that, that <laughs> feedback, that feedback in first person, real time. Live. people. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. Yep. So that yeah. is that is great feedback. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. And we so do then, have the recordings, but we love you live better. And so mm. yeah, we always and and the Enthus Champion call does the two two as well. But we try to make it a standard. Um, there's definitely yeah. some exceptions, but the thing I love about MGCI is it's really about how to be a successful community member. And how to use community as a place to grow your career, to grow your skills, to maybe branch out and meet other people that you might not normally meet or do things you might not normally do. Um, Heather and I are both poster children for having the community support our career development efforts. And we believe everybody can use it in the way that works for them, too. It's inclusive. You don't want to speak. You don't have to. You can write a blog post or help set up an event. There's a thousand things to do, but the people that you meet there um, are really important. They've been very important for, you know, my life. I've made friends there, but also yeah. my career. And so um, we just want everybody else to have that same opportunity that we did. 
Yeah. So 100%. let's let's come around now, guys, to an, a really important initiative. I I absolutely agree because you know I know that community has made um it's made a learning community for us. You know, a learning community for me. But you know, let's come around to the um Microsoft adoption site and what's yeah. the path yes. it's taking? Because we've got a lot of new, lots of new content. Lots of there's been some big changes in the last month, and I'll be going through some of it. I've got it in my what's new to adoption. In fact, my what's new to adoption component has gone from nothing to two or three pages to like 30 to 40 pages and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it's wonderful yeah. to see that, that that we can bring it over and focus more on adoption and I mean I still got all the what's new and it ends up being like 130 40 pages every month right. in my presentation yeah. that a lot of people can use as a takeaway but I want to focus more a little bit on the adoption side and where you're going with that guys and you know the any support that you need from us even as a community across the ANZ and those that are joining globally to be able to help and support you on it. Absolutely. Well, I wouldn't be a good Microsoft employee if I didn't have a few slides that I wanted to Bring show them. along the way of this talk track. And these um, can be used with your with your own teams or whatever you want, but it'll just help frame this a little bit. So, you know, um, Kirsty is you'll right. Provide us, down you'll provide us a copy of this so that they, we can use it here as yeah. well, if possible. Absolutely. 100%, Thank you. 100%. Yep. And this is actually, yeah, it's a subset of a couple different decks, but I'll give you this one in particular. Yes. Um, so the very first thing that everybody needs to know is, is that we're changing the way we talk about this work that we've all been doing for decades. And we're we're now landing on the term user enablement. And why? Because what we're really driving is an outcome of user satisfaction, right? Adoption can be about counts and amounts and how many people are using something. Um, but, and, and adoption is a perfectly good term, but uh, as a company, um, it took us some doing, and I'm going to take a little credit for this one. I managed to get our engineering executive vice president, our marketing executive vice president, our field president, and everybody to agree on the fact that we were going to change this term. And that in and of itself is a bit of a, an adoption ninja Huge. move, if you don't. <laughs> so does this mean I'll have to change my user group name to the Australian Microsoft the 365 User Enablement Group? Do I have to swap Maybe. the words? Yeah. I mean, you know, look, it, it what matters is when Microsoft is talking about this, the people who don't understand this work yeah. are the ones we're actually talking to. You know, this is really for those people who fail to fund training, who don't understand what champions are, who don't understand the human side of change and what it can do for an organization. And so, you know, I feel like our role is to lend credence and validation and support to the work that you all have been doing again for a very long time. So everything that you see now coming forward from my site and, and the work that's coming from uh, the team is going to talk about user enablement. Now, Microsoft as a company will still talk about AI adoption at the C-suite level, like talking to CEOs and what have you, like how are you adopting AI as a capability in your company? But that's about a business function, right? And so user enablement is about the human side. And you know, I just really, I want to have these types of slides that really break out, especially in the era of AI, that there are these three main work streams, these three areas that need attention. Um, and these slides are all brand new. You can find all of them. They're part of the customer success kit uh, for Copilot, but I've kind of moved them around for this very specific conversation. But helping people to understand that really when you're adopting any major new technology, not just co-pilot, right, or AI, you have to get your leadership in line. You have to make sure they understand what's going on and play their roles. There's the human side of change that we all focus on. And then there are technical skills. These three major work streams are so important. And often, whenever I get called in, by the time I get called in to go see a customer, they're stuck. And nine times out of 10, they're stuck because of these first two pillars. Their leadership isn't aligned. There isn't an executive sponsor. There's no top-down messaging to really rally the troops around a cause. And no one's really attending to, with any care and consideration, the human side of change. There aren't any champions. There aren't any office hours. There isn't a self-service training portal or Viva Learning or Enter Certified Learning Pathways. And so it's very common, right, to see these blockers. Um, occasionally, you get hung up on something technical, but it's pretty rare. Now in AI, all of this is built on the responsible AI principles that are built in across our capabilities. But 
frankly, just landing this slide and getting everyone to agree on it inside a you know a company that's as large as ours, um, you know, I really think is is a turn for us as an industry as a as a specialty, uh, because this is going to carry through to more training that's coming out. There will be a user enablement for copilot class coming out via um, via via Microsoft Learning. That is the first one that will replace my very long in the tooth adoption specialist course that I hope all of you have already taken. Um, it's built on those materials, but evolved for the area of AI. And then we already have funded two more courses for more advanced skills in this area as we um, work our way up to the top level navigation of that website, <laughs> which takes some doing. But it's very important that Microsoft recognize what we do here as a discipline and a skill. And we are not just trainers, as sometimes people want to, you know, kind of put us to the side and say we're just training. No, we have a specialty in organizational and human psychology. We understand the root cause analysis of blockers, not only in company-wide rollouts, but in individual user journeys. The things that we can do are unique. And so this additional slide here that I'm showing now is very important because it calls out the fact that user enablement is an equal work stream to technical readiness. I can't tell you how many times I've had to tell some CTO or CIO of some very large company that we are not a subset of technical readiness and we are not a bolt on <laughs> that you think about at the end when the thing you can roll the thing out, but then nobody actually knows who's going to tell anybody. And I keep telling them an email is not a rollout campaign. <laughs> so having this shown in this way, I mean, I'm really proud of this work because we've been fighting this battle for a while, right? And 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 to get this validation and recognition, you know, um, in this era of AI, when things are when these human journeys are so important, is huge, because we learned a lot in the early adopter program for Copilot. Um, my team and I had the privilege of working on that directly. And we began to see that we had to evolve some of our methods. Some of those things I taught in that earlier adoption specialist course aren't relevant anymore, specifically around a pilot program, right? Yeah, you can't really successfully, yeah. yeah, you can't yeah. successfully pilot co-pilot, right? It doesn't work that way. If you take two people from here and three people from over there and four people from over there, they'll all have a poor experience. You need 100 to 300 people together all from the same department working on the same kinds of things um, to go together. So they create a cohort of users and scenarios, you know, that that people can really begin to understand so because it's all about that Caroline, sorry, course, can I yeah. just ask on that? Because you know, we'll get we'll get the pushback because IT team will want to go the traditional, you know, two here, three there, because we've got all this. You know, what was the main core reason that we can use to push back on something like that? You know, what's our real argument yes. around it? Well, there's two, there's two core things. Number one. Um, you still need to onboard your help desk, your champion leaders, and your IT folks ahead of time. So that is the first cohort that becomes actually your earliest adopters. But they are not testing productivity or creativity gains with Copilot. They're simply get, getting familiar so that they can help others. It's a very different call to action from that initial group that you onboard. The first group of users, uh, the main reason is that they need the um, common scenarios they can help each other get to their aha moment. This is not like teaching any other people piece of software where you're teaching people where to click on things on a menu. You're actually having a conversation. You're developing a relationship really with Copilot in your own words, in your own language about your own tools. And so you need to be around people who are doing the same that also have an understanding of your job. If I work in the sales department, no matter what role I have, the other people around me are going to understand that I'm dealing with a sales scenario, right? And that creates um, a network effect um, you know, of learning um, that is extremely powerful and nets higher user satisfaction and ultimately deeper usage. So um, if you want happy users and you want a successful rollout, you take people together. That's my short answer. <laughs> We've got a question that then come up. It's like um, on the size of the business. And when you focus on only those that are like 100 or 200 strong, is there a percentage rather than a hard number? Like if you said take it out to a group yes. of, you know, what kind of a percentage of a group of people that would work together would you then go for? 
Yeah, I would go between 15 and 25. Okay. 15 and 25, because the percentage I quote for champions or, you know, whatever you may call them in your particular organization, we call them champions, is 10%. So we try to have 10% of any organization be champions and the first cohort. So it could be of a department, but if you only have 200 people, you know, put 50 of them together, right? Now they may, in that case, I do SMB as well. And in that case, they often aren't in the same department. They don't have the same roles not enough necessarily. People, yeah, not enough people. Yeah, but, area, they, but they know each other, right? Yeah. They know each yeah. other. And I try to also make a mix when I'm in SMB of friendlies, of technology savvy people and folks who really aren't into it, right? You don't want to put all the people who don't want to do this together at the end, or you yeah. will create an anchor, for yeah. your group uh, inadvertently. An angry right? anchor. An angry <laughs> anchor. And then they'll reinforce each other about how yeah. they don't want to do it. So yeah. you're and trying we can to take people through this little thing here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, will Copilot be included in the Microsoft Learning Pathways, Aviva Learning? You know, that whole, you know, they love the hosted virtual training events, but we need some of those bite sized, you know, e learning options as well to be able to help people on that journey. Absolutely. We already announced, and I'll have to check the date, but it's in within the next month, uh, the Copilot Academy in Viva Learning. Now, mm -hmm. there's parts of that that are part of the core seated license and parts of that that are part of the premium license, um, but that, that basic training will be in there. And it'll also be, of course, available in M365 Learning Pathways also. So all yeah. of that will be lit up before uh, the end of this fiscal year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll let and you then, keep going. I have another question, but grab... we'll do that towards the end. Okay, but I want to say one more thing about training, yes. which is yep. um, you're also going to be able to, the next modules, I have three more modules coming out in my customer success kit, um, which you can get on adoption.microsoft.com. Um, one of them is for workers' council, if you have to deal with that. But one of them yes. is the train the trainer kit. And so we'll be giving you uh, training decks that you can use with folks as a starting place. You'll probably want to move them all around and, and give them your own flavor, but at least you'll have um, the introduction L100 and 200 level courseware that we'll just be giving to you on AMC when I publish that train the trainer kit. Right. There's some great content in there, guys. I've got a um, screenshot of it coming up in my what's new. So you'll see that very soon. What's there? Yeah, exactly. The last thing I want everybody to remember, especially when they're doing co-pilot work, is I alluded to it a minute ago. Um, you know, people feel like co-pilot is different than everything else, and in many respects it is. But humans are humans, right? And they are having a different experience with co-pilot because, as I said, they're using their natural language skills. They're talking to it about their own tasks and their own things. But fundamentally, they're still going through the user journey that we have seen about Teams or SharePoint or OneDrive or a thousand other things. Why should I care? right, is their first question. And there's all of these unarticulated questions that people have. You're also going to see as a part of this advanced user enablement training, um, uh, there's a methodology that we have that basically marry micro actions, things that you can do as a user enablement specialist to the particular place the person is in their user journey. And basically you can think of it as, as mini behavioral modification training, specifically around a technology. Um, and there's a lot of research that's gone into this, partnering with this amazing woman, uh, Susan Ettinger, um, who's over on the Azure side of the house. She's just brilliant. And you know, between my UE stuff and, and her research, together we're coming together and saying, OK, you have a user who is wondering how they're supposed to use it. But what they're really wondering is, you know, how, what scenario should they pick or what is a scenario even? Because nobody knows what that word really means. Let's be clear. Right. What set of tasks should they try is really what they're trying to think about. And then we can marry the content we have and the things you can say and do to that particular person. Um, I think that we are going to need to improve our skills as user enablement specialists to to provide a little bit more personalized um, support for folks. And of course, and I think Rishi's out there on this call. As a matter he of fact, we, we always want to remember the modern collaboration architecture and the amazing work that they've done to uh, update it for Copilot, but also make it more personal and more actionable in its light version. So. 
you know, you can take this work as far as you want to go, but I encourage you to really be be trying to do some root cause analysis on the people in your organizations. What are they really thinking? What are they feeling? Ask them, of course, get feedback, put out a form, use the Microsoft feedback stuff, whatever you want to do, but, but also really think about what all is affecting them. Um, I think when we we operationalize our empathy for other people. It makes us even better at this work. And it also brings yeah. a certain compassion and energy, you know, to to things um, that I think people really need right now. They need to know that they're important in the era of AI, that they are more important than the technology because yeah. they're hearing a lot of messages that would say otherwise, right? Yeah, we've had um, we had Rishi come and speak to us in regards to Mocha a um, couple of times, and I know with the latest updates, we'll have him coming back shortly to continue on on that journey. We've um, been having some discussions. We've had a few changes there, but looking forward to it. Heather, yes, you want to say? Oh, you know, we we were uh, Carolina and I were both in Redmond last week, so we went for an offsite for our own teams, and we were hanging out with folks. And there was an exercise that we did where we were trying out some. Um, some technology around Copilot, and it was really interesting um, because I think you know one. I love the the. It's like a lot of this stuff is the same adoption user enablement things that we have had, but they're just they're tweet they're they're changed they're shifted. There's you know the three pillars. Like I love those slides because it just. Sometimes you need to, like I like to say, judge it, right? Where you, you're given it a, a different look, a different way that's based on sort of a new, you know, a new swim lane that we have. Um, one of the things that was really interesting as well was that I think that Copilot, where is it? It's this new AI future thing with the large language models and all of that stuff. However, what it's going to do in organization is that it's going to lift the covers up on how you organize your information because yes. of the way co-pilots work. And it's like, hmm, where do I put things? How have I tagged them? Are they in document libraries? Are they, do they have the right metadata? All of that kind of stuff. Where is it pulling from? So you're going to have a bit of like go, where you're going to go. Ooh, we can, we need to clean up the, you know, aisles five, six, and seven in the grocery store over here, yeah, you know? Yeah. And that's really interesting because that gets you also back to basics on some of your M365 products of how you use SharePoint, how do you use OneDrive, yep. all that yes. kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So it's so it's, true. Yeah. Pe people didn't yeah. even think about that. They're so focused on the bright, shiny object of AI yeah. that they forgot that it is really about, you know, how you're using SharePoint and OneDrive, where you're storing those documents, information architecture you do or most places don't have, um, right. you know, the data yeah. and security controls, all of this, you know. The it, compliance, it's very, very the important. permissions, the what have you yeah, got to access it. to Permissions or not, are everything. And, yeah. 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 Copilot grounds its answers on the information that it can see for you as a user. And so it matters, right? And, and you know, I'll, I'll add one more kind of funny antidote, which is nobody likes me to talk about the Delve disasters that happened when people turned on Delve. <laughs> they would prefer that I what never Delve? say that on, phrase. What, what Delve? You mean that? You mean the piece of carpet that we put the dust and then put the, you know, <laughs> put it back That's down exactly again? I like right. that. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that that one. Every, yep. The one that everybody mm -hmm. wants to forget existed. Yes. But I remember the Delve disasters because I answered all those phone calls of people freaking out because they didn't realize that they hadn't checked the permissions of their main HR website, or they hadn't updated those modern Finance. groups, or no one was really paying attention to the, the distribution groups and people that have been assigned to different things. And so yep. there's a lot of work for us to do with our partners in IT. And that's the last thing I'll say is this slide, which is the executive summary of an implementation plan for Copilot. One of the reasons we built it in this way is because there are shared milestones between the user enablement work stream and our IT pro friends. Because one of the greatest outcomes that we could possibly have from the era of AI is being better partnered with our IT admins. Um, sometimes in, in organizations, the IT person and the user enablement person don't talk, 
or they're the same person if you're an SMB, right? And one usually gets, you know, um, kind of ignored for the other role, right? And when you have to configure something that tends, tends to take priority over actually talking to people. Um, and so we really need to deepen our skill set with our IT pro friends and make sure that we're operating um, as one unit. That's especially true if you work in larger organizations where sometimes there's a schism there between the two groups. And you know, now's an opportunity for us to acknowledge and, and appreciate what they do and to also make sure that they acknowledge and appreciate what we do. Um, and and that it is it's our shared success that will put us on this life cycle journey in, the, in a different way. So, yes, that is yeah. my talk track about that. Yeah. We must come together. <laughs> Kirsty, I'm good because I'm parked, so I can go oh. till seven. So, okay, listen. you're you're all good. Excellent news. Um, there's yeah. a couple of questions. Some are more in uh, so the nitty gritty of Copilot, um, which I mean yeah. we can always have a look at. But there's things like um, the suggesting of trunk tracking the prompt sharing, things like that. Is there you know how do you suggest tracking prompt sharing? Uh, and I'm like kind of going, well, there's you know there's some other texts and information out there to be able to help and licensing for analytics and why is actually my question. Mm -hmm. um, so there's two there's two answers to that. If you're trying to create a sense of shared learning, right? That's what your community is for. Uh, and I think that if you're not using Viva Engage or Microsoft Teams or some other co internal community tool for that, that that's a, a huge missed opportunity and will slow down your enablement. Um, people will naturally share prompts with each other. People are not so interested in having their prompts tracked and put into libraries and stuff like that. We've got very clear feedback from customers that the, the, the user enablement people, the managers kind of like that idea, but the actual people themselves do not. Um, they feel that they're being tracked inappropriately. They, they get nervous and maybe they put the prompt in wrong. People, nobody, nobody has a lot of confidence about how to work with this yet. Don't let anybody tell you that they do, right? Heather and I are talking about this. We need to make sure our team knows how to do the top 10 things to try from our customer success kit because we've been busy building stuff, not doing it, right? So yeah. um, I just think you have to be very careful about, I wouldn't say prompt tracking. I would say share your knowledge, right? Yeah. Make it fun, yeah. right? Make it something that's good that you're in charge and in control of. And then if you want to go and scrape that on the back end and save some of them, you know, for reporting or something, you can do that for yeah. learning. But um, try to make it so that it's not like people, you know, kind of um, keeping a log of yeah. what they're doing. Right. There yeah. is and I like uh, coming the, up. I, sorry, I was going to say Heather Stuart read out. Stuart read out and the, and the team that in GitHub have got Prompt Buddy that's just come out yes. so that you can then, you know, um, upvote mm -hmm. and put prompts in to be able to share votes. And sure. with that's that, awesome. you might then be able to kind of go, well, how many people are liking? Because you've got to, you know, yes. upvotes and like it. So it might be a way. Yeah. I just don't, sorry. I'm I'm never a fan, sorry, one thing, Heather, I'm never a fan no, of that good. Go ahead. because you know why in some organizations that turns into a popularity contest mm -hmm. and the people have mm -hmm. time to lobby for their particular thing or who people might know more or what have you. I've just seen those projects go south a little bit. And so I like the idea and I think it's a super cool solution and that's awesome. But just check with your own culture if that's going to work in your environment, right? That's all. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Jamie's saying they have a loop page where they share prompts and ideas and that's things like awesome. that on loop. Yeah, no, I love, love it. I love loop. Love loop. Yeah, that's yeah. it. You do. Um, there's one that's here that getting questions around, um, you know, versioning or when it comes to documentation and you know pulling from potential, you know, versioning. Um, you know how Copilot then understands multiple documents of the same subject where you've got a ton of versions. It's coming up supposedly as as questions and um for for some. Yes, and so that goes back to the information architecture. In the first place, Copilot is going to look at the most, the the uh, the authenticated version, right? So any document I write, I probably have 15 versions of it. 
in the actual version of that single file, it's going to look at the most recent one. If it finds that file, that same file in multiple SharePoint sites, it's actually going to use any information architecture weighting that exists. If it's on a hub site, if it's on a primary site, as we move into knowledge management capabilities in the future, we're going to be able to say, what is the authoritative source for information on marketing or user enablement or community or what have you? But we don't have that capability yet, but we will. Um, and it's also going to look at, obviously it's already, I mentioned it's looking at permissions and what have you, but if it finds the same document on multiple SharePoint sites that is actually like bit by bit the same, like a computer level the same, it's going to use the most recent file to, to ground and synthesize your answer. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It's a problem if you have that file multiple places. Like imagine the scenario where you don't have any information architecture and your social media policy is on everybody's, you know, different site. Like that could be real problems. So um, yeah. IA will definitely matter. Yeah. Caitlin's put a hand. I oh know Caitlin's taking a hand down. All good. Let's have a chat about Copilot Lab because I know I use it an awful lot. It's a really great place to be able to go to start creating prompts because a lot of people don't know where to even start or how to build it out what is a good prompt and it's quite different and you know, I've talked to the guys you know and ladies and and fellows before about sort of prompting and changing the way that we go from a command based to that conversational based type prompt yep. and it's not necessarily in everyone's natural language and way of doing things after so long so you know, let's just have a chat about the copilot lab I think Copilot Lab, I mean, you know, what I there's three things I like about the Copilot, Copilot Labs. Number one, it's built into every product. So we talk a lot about learning in the flow of work, but Microsoft doesn't always do a great job of that. You have to go to another experience, go find a website, go find the blog post or what have you. But with Copilot Lab, it's built in there right with your prompt uh, screen. So you can simply make the click and get some suggestions, right? Copilot Lab is also the engineering behind the scene that's always giving you suggestions about the next type of prompt you should create. Um, but I do think it is a change of mind. Like Copilot, it summarizes, it creates, you can ask it something, right? There's a, there's a few core things it does that's very different from how you think about search. Um, and so being able to use it is great. Now there are um, ideas in the future of actually Copilot Lab, you being able to have core prompts at an organizational level. But of course, anytime anybody asks us to build something at an organizational level, that means we have to build in governance and security and other things along with that. So I imagine it'll take some time before that actually lands. Um, but I'm thrilled about how we're continuing to share our journey, our set of prompts, the more we learn about Copilot and what it can do, for every business user, the more we're putting in there and continuing to integrate it. There's one other thing I just want to say, which is for those smaller organizations who maybe haven't licensed Copilot and Microsoft 365 yet, go visit copilot.microsoft.com right and get started practicing your prompting skills with the web version then of course you can log in with your enter id and flick the little switch to work and then use it in that way um, but if you're in a situation where you want to build these skills yourself and but your organization or you don't have a license for it yet you can start just right on the web and it does some great work out there and um, I feel that between practicing with copilot.microsoft.com and using Copilot Labs, we can build our own skills so that we're able to help other people. Yeah. Jamie's got a great question. Um, is, you know, favorite use case for Copilot? Uh, for each great. of you. Heather, what is you your go? favorite use case? How are we going for time? There you sure. go. You're good. Oh, we're good. Yeah, we're good. Uh, yeah, in my office today, yeah, I'm in the car. Yes. So, um, <laughs> that, uh, uh, you work wherever you are. Um, so Something for me, you've done. you know, yeah, I, I took a presentation of mine, the how to kick fear and toxicity out of the workplace. And I wanted to update it and just give it some new life. And I thought, oh, wait a minute. I'm going to see what happens if I put this actual topic into Copilot for PowerPoint and see what happens. And I was, you know, my mouth dropped open because it literally, and I was like, I want a 20 slide deck on how to compare, blah, 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 and I put in like, you know, four kind of big topics and it made a deck. 
And I was like, holy bananas. I was like, this is crazy. And it was literally, it was like, like, like about three, three minutes, three, three seconds. seconds. Um, And then I compared it against what I had been presenting and it was, it was pretty darn close. You know what I mean? Like I, I just didn't heatherized it of course, but you know, but like it was pretty amazing. And I was able to do that with, you know, a topic that was kind of a little bit more, you know, it wasn't super, super specific, but I, I was blown away because it just saves so much time as far as like it put in pictures that it thought matched and it put in graphics and everything looked the same. And it was really a nice template and all of that stuff. I, yeah, that was, it blew my mind frankly. So. Caruana, what yeah. about you? I love those scenarios, but mine are much more kind of tactical. So after getting this new, so I've had this new job inside Microsoft since July. Um, I got put on the co-pilot project right before I took the new job for all of M365. And I don't think I realized what a crazy train co-pilot was going to be. So I'm <laughs> struggling with keeping up with everything. And so I'm a big fan of um, summarize all the communications for my boss over the last two weeks, right? I like to make sure that I don't miss things from the people who, you know, bless my paycheck. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. So I tend to do things like that. And also because I'm terrible with email, but I'm back in email land now at this different level, I have to do more email and teams. And so that's one of the reasons also that I use the web client, because it does such a great job of pulling chats and emails together on a topic or from people. And then I can really look at it and take that information in. And it's not going to give me every single detail, but it's going to make me a whole lot more smart about some particular topic or subject than the five minutes before I asked that question. Um, And so any place that it can summarize or gather on my behalf, I spend an inordinate amount of time looking for information from people that are important across different endpoints, my text, my email, my teams, my, you know, carrier pigeons on my window, right? And so anything that I can do (laughs) to make that, you know, be, I want to be a good manager, which means paying attention and answering people in a timely fashion. And I really struggle with that. So um, yeah, I, that's that's my favorite. I I even just did it um, last month, I think it was, or maybe before, where I used to have a paragraph for the user group that was, you know, here's the recording and here's the presentation and here's this and stay on mute and blah, blah. And I yeah. just put it, I just copied and pasted the usual I put, put it into OneNote and I went, convert it to bullet points because I wanted to simplify it down so that I could yeah. use that. And it, it was great because it just went, rather than me doing it, just a quick flip over and I use that now. So you'll actually see it in this meeting where totally. I converted yeah. it. Just something really <laughs> simple. So you'll be able to see it, you know, it, in our chat. Yeah, I think that people need to remember that you might hear in the media and what have you, people talking about, oh, this is going to make such efficiencies in business and it's going to do this and it's going to do that. What it's really going to do is grow the top line of most businesses so that and that it's also going to allow companies to invest in their employees in ways that where you can build your own skills. Right. Yes, I have no doubt that some jobs may change, but it's giving us such an opportunity to do different work. Right. Microsoft Mm -hmm. doesn't really pay me to hunt through my email to find emails from my boss. Right. It really pays me to figure out how do we do AI at a global scale. Right. And so anything that can unlock my productivity and creativity as an employee is good for the company. Those are the things that I think we as user enablement people need to bring home to leaders. Right. They need to understand the the impact of this uh, from a human perspective, because these fun things are so meaningful, right? I mean, saves me time. Her new deck is awesome. I love the, I love simplifying as you, in case you haven't noticed, I can write, I can write as long as I can talk. And so I need to simplify and sim- you know, <laughs> shorten my paragraphs. Yeah. Um, cause I do write yeah. the way I talk, which sometimes I do intentionally cause I want it to be clear and, and easy to understand, but uh, yeah, it needs simplifying sometimes. <laughs> so in, yeah. in that, you know, we're hearing it we're, from some of the unions. Does this mean it's going to take over my job because it's going to do so much the whole world of AI? And I know that as change professionals, we go, no, but battling that, it, it's, it's going to come up for us and we're going to have to write something in regards to it. Yeah, I don't think it's fair to say no. 
Hmm. I don't think that we should lead people to believe that there won't be jobs changed or phased out because of this technology. The same was true with the steam engine. The same was true with, you know, trains. You know, the same has been true with every te major technology revolution that has ever existed. The yeah, question yeah. is how, yeah. right? Are those people not having those jobs because they got a better one because they're more skilled with different talents now, right? Mm -hmm. Are they changing roles and are those jobs not necessary because the company has grown and has five more products it was able to get out to market more quickly because of yeah. AI, right? These are the things that I, that's what I think we need to reinforce as the message. Jobs yes. will change. The question is how, Do and you we have are the sense. ones in charge. Yeah, we're yeah, the ones in charge of making sure that that's a positive change. Heather, sorry, yeah. go ahead. And, no, I think it's about also like, you know, I have friends who, you know, didn't jump on the learning how to, you know, go from film editor to digital editor or, you know, like there's there's places where you can see where if you didn't make the leap in technology to learn it, mm -hmm. you did get left behind potentially, right? So it is, yeah. and I think I've seen this in chat. It's like, you know, you're going to be somebody who knows how to and learns how to use this. And I want the repetitive stuff that I have to do all the time to have done by co-pilot. You know, if I, I need some sort of a strategic document for this, that, and the other thing, I'm, I'm going to put that in. Now, I'm going to always put my own spin on it and yeah. make it specific to what I'm doing. And that's the stuff. If you get fast and good at that, that's mm -hmm. wicked mm -hmm. valuable. And then you can think about all the other cool and creative things that you want to do in and around something else. You know, yeah. so I think it's learning the technology, learning prompts, becoming a prompt engineer, all of those things to, you know, really get get good at it. And that's practicing. And you know what? The other thing is, is practice on copilot.microsoft.com, but also go practice in Microsoft Designer. You know, yeah. that's out there yes. too. Play, go play and have it be fun. Make weird pictures of stuff. Like it's oh, awesome. Oh, I've been right? doing like, plenty of that. Out, Actually, you know, you know yeah. speaking of speaking of even doing the weird <laughs> pictures, I was doing a comms piece up for an organization yeah. and they got very specific color and look and feel to it. Sure. And 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 I was I was doing it for a champs program. So I started using, you know, <laughs> using the designer to create me pictures that I knew yeah. would, you know, was my own that I could use to put in. In all these comms pieces you know show yep. me it with a surface laptop and a headphones and a wi-fi and this yeah. and this and this kind of iconography and build it in dark blue with this and, this. and it just gave me back you know all the and i just kept doing little iterations yeah, i mean yeah. you know fun. how amazing it's fun yes it's so totally. fun i yeah. use that for all of my even my christmas card that i managed to make of <laughs> my husband and myself and my awesome. two dogs look like us i think i have that picture someplace um, it, it was i gotta run y'all no thank you so Bye. much heather for coming along yeah, yeah, appreciate yeah. it right. uh big love and the, that's the other side of the heart is my other hand holding the phone so all right, all right. talk to y'all yeah. soon thank all you right. <laughs> bye, all right. bye. Bye. It's nice. so true. Um, but but um, yeah, she's a hundred percent right. Yeah. Like make yeah. it fun, you know, and but and and do recognize that, you know, look, there are still people out there in the world who store everything on their C drive and never learned the cloud. But are they, you know, should they do they feel super confident about their jobs? I don't know. I, you know, I definitely think that it's important um, to stay up on the skills of the day. That doesn't mean that you the other last thing I want to say on that, too, is combining technology knowledge with industry specific knowledge, quite frankly, is how I ended up here. Right. I was a legal technology expert. Um, I was actually a paralegal and then I learned legal technology and then I became a legal technology expert. Right. And so I wasn't a paralegal anymore. I didn't go to law school. I chose not to go that path. I went this way instead. And so, you know, there's a lot to be said for combining what people already know and are excellent at with this technology um, and then going forward with it. And, and I think that there's going to be a lot of need for that as we see this come into um, you know, different industries, right, over time, for sure. Yeah. So then the, the Copilot Success Kit, uh, and it's constantly changing. Um, you know, I, I, when I downloaded it even over a month ago, it, I've downloaded it again just recently. There's so much more that's packed into it now. Um, and that's sort of coming through in the release notes, and I'll continue to try and, you know, keep everyone up to date along the way. But where are we at in regards to the Success Kit now, Caruana? 
Well, it's only um, really the official success kit is like three weeks old. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. We did start, we did have, we have adoption.microsoft.com, WAC Copilot. Um, that is the main hub um, for all of these materials. And if you don't have that bookmark, you absolutely need to, um, because now you can get to the success kit. You can get to our interactive scenario library that is very good to use, not only with business folks who want to understand how they're going to measure the value of Copilot, but people so that they can get some inspiration about fun things to do. Um, so we have that, and that is definitely changing twice a week, sometimes three times. We're adding something new, new features, new blog posts, new content, what have you. Um, but the success kit itself is going to, we're going to try to keep it reasonably stable in terms of its components, but different pages may change. So um, the, some of the slides you saw today were from the implementation summary for leaders. Um, there's a long and deep uh, user enablement and technical readiness guides. Um, there's a business leaders guide to AI adoption. That's talking about it as a function, you know, for the those C-suite people, um, and then a wonderful deck on accelerating co-pilot enablement with Microsoft Viva and all the Viva components. And we're, you know, lots of other handouts in it. It's a heavy download. I apologize. Um, lots and lots of That's slides. Right. Takes a little Content. while. Yeah, but I'm, you know, and so um, more modules are coming out, the Train the Trainer Kit, the Workers' Council Guide. Um, I have some more, my contribution, you know, besides the the organizing the whole thing is to write articles. I'm really focused on um, the leadership journey. Um, of course, I'm focused on user enablement, but sometimes we write this leadership stuff that's kind of very fluffy or very high level for people who are C-suite at some humongous company. Well, I owned my own company. I still know how to need to know how to go through that leadership journey. So I'm writing more practical articles. The one I'm working on right now is how to pick an AI vendor. It's actually actually, um, you know, company agnostic, and it's about picking suppliers in general, but especially in AI, um, and more things like that, how to create an AI uh, council in your organization, you know, recognizing that it's not about the technology, it's about trust. So more articles like that will be coming for me on a monthly basis. And I post them on LinkedIn, um, too, and and do some videos about them and, and stuff like that. So, yeah. you know, yeah. we try to talk about all of that in our uh, um, Mondays at Microsoft show, which all of you would probably see on replay. Um, it is on at eight o'clock in the morning, Pacific time, 30 minutes, but it is on YouTube and um, LinkedIn so that you can get all the links that we talk about and post pretty easily. Yeah. And and by the way, everyone, when you go onto the site, if you go just to the straight copile and it's got um, download the adoption kit, uh, it's only got a small amount and it. it's sort of the original version. But if you go over in to this link, it will give you the full adoption kit with all of the content in it. Okay. No, actually, that's mm -hmm. not that's actually not correct. If you go to adoption on Microsoft, I, my yeah. the main link on that the page download the full success the kit. Yeah, yeah, it's but it's actually you click on Copilot Success Kit and it shows you a page of all the components. Yes, that but if you click the on the if you click on the download the adoption kit on the main um, adoption for the commercial like the Copilot, it actually only gives you um, a, a small amount of information compared to over there because I pulled them both down yeah. today. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. absolutely. Mm. So yes, make sure you go through and get the full meal the deal. Full absolutely. Kit. <laughs> yeah, the full kit on that Copilot Success Kit. Go there because the adoption kit elsewhere is um, hasn't quite got everything that you will need there. Absolutely. Um. So the you know grab that grab that information. There's there's tons in there. I particularly love this some of the scenario the personas. So you know some of that persona stuff that we often like. Um, that's all in there too, guys, by the way. And I mean, I've talked about it last month and, uh, you know, some of the stuff that was there and I'll talk a lot more about it in terms of the new features and getting started. And, um, you know, Caruana, I'll continue. I've been pulling together. What are all the sites? Where do I go for everything to pull together for the user group for you? Um, I haven't recorded my three days worth of work because it'll be too much for you. <laughs> To hit you, yeah, it's a lot, everything. and yeah, it I want to understand. I know I want to understand what that is, so that we can automate that for you. Um, and we do a fair amount for our champions program, trying to get all the new stuff, all the what's new is very large. But yes, I would love to know how you do that, so maybe I can make that better for everyone. 
No, we will get there. Thank you so much, Farrell Caruana. Are there any more questions for anyone here? More than happy to um, to put them up. If not, then we will start going over, and I'll get stuck into some of the the what's new for this space. Which I mean, there's there's um, lots as always. <laughs> So much. Oh, look at that. Wicked valuable. Okay, that is cool. I love uh, that. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. That's uh, great. Well, you all enjoy. Have a wonderful rest of your meeting. And um, and Christy, just let me know if you have any questions or need any yep. help or anything, you know where to find both Heather and myself. We're always willing to help. Thank you for everything you do for this community and, and oh, really for welcome. so many people. We appreciate you. Thank you. And uh, well, I look forward, if there's any other questions, guys, just put them into chat and I can always yep. either answer them myself or we'll get, get others to come in over time. But thanks very much, Carolina. And you know, thanks to Heather too. Appreciate it. So You're welcome. let's get into See you what's later. Here. Okay. Um, I know, Keshari, I, you know, I love my avatar too. I, you know, I do. I look like I'm a 19-year-old. And I went, make it a middle-aged. It didn't like me. That It just, you know, so I went, make me old. <laughs> and then it kind of went to the other extreme. But I kind of like the 19-year-old me. And, Shari, I wanted to say, whilst I got everyone on the call in this community, congratulations, Shari, oh. got the email today to say she has become an MVP. So thank I wanted you. to say thank you uh, for doing what you do and um, and big kudos to you. So thank you, everyone, to give her a bit of a bit of a heads up. So Shari came and presented for us a little while ago. A little while ago now, wasn't it? So did a oh, back of the day on the chat. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We will. <laughs> right. Let's get ourselves underway on what's new in adoption. Okay, so much content. We're already at 107. Let's see how we go. Look, if you can't stay, I understand because we're already an hour and 22 in and I've got, uh, you know, probably an hour's worth of content. So um, uh, feel free to watch the recording. But just in the adoption space alone, even if you just want to stay for that core component before we get to the what's new. Um, my wheel infographic is out there with all of its new updates. If you're wanting a copy, you can always download a high res copy. Um, it's in there. You just put in the entry. 365 wheel in the bit.ly link and that will allow you to be able to pull it down and I will always try and keep it as updated as possible. Um, the um, I did a webinar on the productivity piece. Feel free to go and watch. There is my YouTube channel, which is where you're going to find all of the recordings. So this will go up within the next week so that you can come back and watch it. There are a T heaps and heaps of questions that are always answered in the AMA alongside the likes of Shari, who comes along, though we didn't see you today, Shari, on our recording this morning. But um, we get in and we'll quite continue to answer. So if you do have questions, you know, you can always flip them through to me in this um, in this chat too and I can put it to our community to answer for you. The chance calls which we've been talking about with Caruana and Heather, the last one was around Copilot for Sales but it's got actually other information in there for you to be able to go and have a look at around some of the new features so love it. I know it's always a always a busy day. Release notes. Now, um, it's great that the team are actually putting out there the release notes. Occasionally, there might be links that are broken. I do always report this back. If there's something in particular that you see or you see an update and it's not in the release notes, I'm more than happy to provide that to the team and sort of say we didn't put this in or that in or it's not clear for you. If you're not sure, um, I'll try and make it a little clearer. So what is out there? Um, Caruana just recently put out a blog piece around the user enablement and the era of AI. Um, a great read. Highly recommend going in and um, going through sort of what it is that she's actually talking about. We've great to have her here on the fireside chat, but there's some more content that's specific for us in there. So the Modern Work Customer Hub has had, and last month we talked about it, it is constantly getting updated at the moment, bringing information together into one big one big hub. So I'm loving some of the training sessions that are actually being put out there. Uh, some of them are live, but they do have the recordings for you to be able to look at. New blog out there was around town halls and what and a whole new site around coming in around town halls and guidance around delivering some of those virtual events. So it is a new adoption site specifically under teams around town halls and helping you and what's actually coming over the next quarter. 
Inside Microsoft Teams. So if you had um, gone to one of the recent conferences that's actually being held overseas at the moment, there was a lot of announcements around building that foundation for the future. A bit of a wrap up that was actually talked about by Jeff Tepper, um, Tepa, I should say. Um, so there's some great information. I will touch on a couple of things as we go around some of the components that are coming up, the vision and a few other things. We'll have more as the year goes on, I suppose, between Microsoft um, insight and ignite and as the year happens we'll see more and more come in but one to go and watch the new planner there is a couple of sessions where you can actually go in we've got the meet the makers and learn what's coming next so this is a call it's a live event on april 3rd at 10 a.m now this is in um, pst time so it will be sort of early hours of the morning if you're wanting to go and register the recording will actually be there and um, same for microsoft planner have got to ask me anything off the back of it so you can actually then continue on and have those further conversations with those guys so you can go and register there is a ton of new content under the Copilot space. It's had a really big, as I said, sort of three three weeks old in terms of this component. Um, go and have a look and investigate what is in there. The success kit, which we've talked about, I've put it all in here, including some of the links that is going to be able to help and support you. So it is all in the current deck. Don't forget the presentation is actually pinned in chat if you're wanting to go to the deck and click on any of these links. In the Copilot for 365, there is a couple of things that in here I would be highly recommending. You can just go and do the download of the whole kit, or you can come in and start to do download of individual components, such as like the, the guide summary, for example. But there are, you know, some core things in here that I did particularly like. It's, you know, getting over into the scenario library. That was one in particular that I do like in terms of having a bit of a play around. Underneath the um, underneath the user enablement, I'll come to that, is a whole heap more. So it's kind of the individual components of the success kit for you. When you do a download of the full success kit, you're going to get all this content. So there's all this getting ready swag, and that actually includes all of the logos as well. So it's like, yay, love getting all of the logos. So you've got all that in there in the swag. There are emails that you can customize, and then there's that train the train trainer kit. Now in the trainer trainer kit, if you download the train the trainer kit on its own, I think I might have put a comparison. I'll just talk about it here. This scenario library isn't actually in the training kit in here where it is when you do the download on its own. So you will get it's still the same content ultimately, but different things come down depending on how you've you've actually pulled it down. So just if you can't find something, it's you might just want to go a little higher. Um, but there is a training content map and there's a few other things. I'm going to come up to that. So underneath the usual enablement, this is where I was talking about if you download just that trainer kit, it does look a little different because the scenario library, you know, over here is something that's then kind of separate. Okay. But it is in the trainer kit if you just pull it down on its own. Okay. Now, all this content, as you start to bring it down, a few other things. So here you'll see the content training map. I love this. Now, I've talked about some of this content previously in the last session. Now, the training content map, what I love about that is it's all laid out really nicely for you around that getting ready and the user experience to be able to support you. Um, hi, Paul. It will be in the in the chat a little, you know, if you go back in the chat. Otherwise, I'll drop it in for you. It's also up on YouTube, the previous um, uh, presentations. If you go there, it's in there in the link in last month's previous YouTube Thanks for the asking, Paul. Because there's a lot of content that I might not put in this month that's also in last month or the month before for that matter. So all of these links, go and have a look. The one thing I love about this is if you've actually set up for yourself, so say you've got learning pathways that you've put into place, you could, and it will have some Copilot stuff coming in, but you could start to build out your own kind of learning components and put them into your own learning portal. There is this creating an AI council, and it was talked about a couple of times. Carolina brought it up a few times. 
She's actually put this out. It is a PDF on how to, what does it look like? It's a good 12 pages long, but some really rich content in there around having a council around AI to ensure that you've got good governance and compliance and training and, you know, bringing people on that journey. And what does it look like for help desk and IT and senior leadership and kind of bringing people together to make sure that you're on the right journey, voting and all sorts of things. Okay. Um, have discussed this one previously. I've kept it in specifically because tonight you've got another session kicking off. All of these are available and are in recording along with downloading the presentations. I love this. I've gone in and downloaded. There's some great content and I know that it's going to be some training pieces that are coming through in the kit, but if you want to actually have a look through, you've got some good training content in there to be able to kick yourself off and get yourself started. So discovering, getting in, this is the next one, the user enablement side, and there's the presentation in here that's being created and built. So you can, and then the next one's coming up. So we haven't got it yet. So the third one, the Succeed in Organisational Transformation, the recording hasn't gone live yet. Cross fingers, we'll have it soon and we'll be able to download the presentation for that one too. So the some great rich content being pushed out there. Now the modern work, that hub that we talked about and looked at a little bit you know, ago in terms of the presentation, there is a lot of great sessions that are actually out there that are being run live, but you'll see down the bottom here on the completed sessions, you've got the session slides and the recording. So because they're often not at a great time for us, some really fabulous resources in there for us to be able to draw down and actually use, especially with, you know, let's not reinvent the wheel when it comes to our training or our presentations to senior leaders or why on the journey when we've got such amazing rich content um, across sort of this modern workplace now. And we talked and touched on the prompt buddy. Um, it is out there. It is free on GitHub to be able to pull down. It's I quite like it from an end user enablement side of things where you can put in prompts and we can actually vote. I know Caruana, um wasn't a great fan and that whole um, competing type stuff, but we're seeing it used quite well. And it depends on the community that you've actually got as to whether it will actually work from you to be able to put it in. Um, you can also categorize them and have them put in underneath for specific roles. So I do like that. Okay. No. Um, okay, thanks, Paul. I will have a look at it. So the Microsoft Viva Insights and there's some new articles. So underneath the adoption side, underneath the Viva Insights, there are articles in there. Um, I do like some of the articles. There's one in particular that I uh, particularly enjoyed. It was the uh, rise of the 30 minute meetings. I did love that one. Um, the downside, I think, with some of the articles, it doesn't necessarily have a date as to how old they are. I think you'll find sort of a lot of these are based around the kind of 2020 period of going into um, uh, uh, the pandemic and really going hybrid, but you know it's something as a as a feedback I've provided to the team. Not quite sure in terms of how old some of those resources are now. Um, Viva Goals Office Hours, some really amazing content. So twice, often twice a month, sometimes once to twice a month, there is a, a session that's being run. And all of that content is available for you. Now, even in here, it's not even necessarily about goals as such. There's some really good content that is a little bit more even leadership dreads, uh, uh, leadership led, I should say, not dread, leadership led around how to do things like building high performing teams, coaching a healthy team. And it isn't even necessarily about Viva Goals because there's some really good content in there just around um, some of those soft skills. The Viva Glint has now got, of course, it's Ask the Experts. We've talked about this a little bit. If you want to watch the previous one, it is now in there for you to be able to go to and download and watch. In that Ask the Expert resources, there is a um, on the one of the previous that session in that download that I actually did. So if I came back here, how the design principles here, this design principles for surveys, some really great questions that if you're not necessarily even got glint 
then you might want to do your own surveys where you could actually use this content from a change perspective around people. So there's other ways that we can pull on it even if we don't have the technology. So there's a couple of slides in there. Another one that came out was a, um, a kind of a news white paper around think like people scientists and telling compelling, compelling stories. There's some um, awesome stuff in there. I really like that combination of how do we how do we create a story and what does the journey actually look like? And it's got a ton of pages in the presentation. This was just one of them that I particularly liked around taking us on a story. We're always on a storytelling as an adoption specialist or user enablement specialist. We're always on a bit of a storytelling side of things. So there's some good content in there. Um, and that leads into PowerPoint. It leads into all sorts of all sorts of information on how to do that, how to do that journey. It's got a bit of a, a little bit of a step by step through it for you. There is a session coming up, the game changer for the employee experience around AI empowerment that's available from the Viva team. If you wanted to join 8 a.m., I think it's around about 2 a.m., but I'm sure there'll be a recording. There's Microsoft Teams for frontline workers. In there, in the resource library now, we've actually got some great content underneath Microsoft Teams for frontline workers. This is a whole new piece that's gone live now to be able to support you in your businesses if you do have a whole frontline worker and how you can actually use Teams for your frontline worker. So it's all kind of come together with some nice kind of little push buttons to download kits. The corporate communications blog. Now, this one hasn't been updated recently. Liz, who used to be an MVP, was putting some of those corporate comms pieces out there and how we could actually use it. There's some history of information there. If you haven't seen it on the corporate communications blog, I would recommend having a look at some of the previous content that's in there in the blog. Some um, fabulous stuff if you're a comms person. The insider blog. Sometimes I will bring content in from the insider blog, depending on what it is. I would highly recommend this is all information that's coming down the line. Now, when I was over at MVP Summit, I did feedback to the PowerPoint team that we're not necessarily being given, you know, what's new to PowerPoint. It's quite difficult to find out what's new to PowerPoint. They generally put their information into the insider blog of what's actually coming and you can have a play around with it and then it lands. So I've asked them if we can please have, you know, more ways to be able to find out this information. But there's lots in there around what's coming if you want to have a look and a read because sometimes it might come up as a um, roadmap um, with its ID and we might not necessarily know what that means, but you might find it in the insider blog. So let's have a look at what's new and coming to M365. Like always, you know, there's a bit of a um, <laughs> long list of information. Okay, let's get in. Coming very soon is the Microsoft Office LTSC for 2024. So this is that standalone version of Office. The last standalone version we had was in 2019. So for 2024, we've got a new standalone version of Office coming out. So that means it's a perpetual license for five years and it doesn't accept any of those future updates. And it's specifically designed for certain scenarios. So, for example, um, you know, if you've got labs that really shouldn't be touched for a while, that submarines, medical equipment on a manufacturing floor, you just want to have it. There's a version of Office there and um, that's it. It's not going to offer anything that that's collaboration. So if you need to do collaborative type stuff when it comes to 365 that we get with the cloud, that is not available because it is just purely standalone. OK, it is um, not being shipped with publisher. If you, we talked about this, I think, in a previous meeting where it was being retired. Publisher is being retired. So it is not going to come out in the new office version. OK, Teams will also need to be downloaded as a separate app. It's not going to be bundled up into that office um, version that's going to come out for download. 
There will be both the Windows and Mac version for commercial and consumer. It will have a professional plus, a standard, and then an embedded. And there'll be a 32 and a 64-bit version available for you. And I mean, I know that um, um, I know that there's going to be a lot of people out there that have been waiting for something because they don't want to put those devices on. Okay. Um, answers in um, Viva. Okay, are now going to come through into Microsoft Search. So Ansys has gone out. In fact, I'll talk about it, but next month we're going to find out a whole heap more around Ansys. So it is flowing through. So if you're in office.com, SharePoint.com, or you're in just general Bing and you're signed in with your work account because you've got your Bing search to do your work search through Bing, then Ansys that come up will now flow through into that search too which is great because if you've got answers and you're using it over in Viva Engage, you want people to be able to ask questions from anywhere and have it surfaced no matter where it is. So looking forward to that, there's going to be that answers digest that's also flowing into the email. Now that building that foundation of a future that I talked about with Jeff Tepper, the video a little bit earlier, the one thing that I did like that I decided I would put in for you is the um, something like compact mode over in Teams. Something, you know, in the new Teams, compact mode, what's coming. Um, there was a couple of um, um, presentations that were particularly good around from the Enterprise Connect 2024 announcements, so the conference. I would recommend maybe going and watching these two videos. So the uh, oh, co-pilot. Some of the things that are going on, information that's actually out there is, you know, what's kind of happening behind the scenes. So there's a few things, there's some information in here to be able to help and support you around the cost. Like when you have a look at the at the blog, I particularly like that it would actually just list out for you on that blog. You know, what are you kind of getting as part of it and how much is it costing if it's free, pro, or 365. So that's the consumer version. Okay. There's always lots of information to digest. Yes, Mandy. There'll be plenty more coming too. Uh, we've only just got to Copilot. We've got all the rest of the products to go. Um, in fact, guys, you know, the one thing I really, really want to ask you is do you want me to just limit this down to the adoption, what's new, and drop all the what's new in features? That's a bit of a thought because then you're not going to get all the what's new features because there's a lot here. If you give me a yes, let's just stick to adoption or no, I love the features. <laughs> I know a lot of time everyone loves the features. So I'll keep going. It's just going to be a longer session. No, so sorry. <laughs> All right. Oh, some of my life vacuuming out of the three days. Yeah, you love the features. Okay. If everyone wants to go in, uh, uh, which I want, it's so hard to work out which I want more. I mean, I'm doing it anyway, but there's, you know, like, I think there's uh, 136 pages. So as long as you're willing to watch the recording and keep going, I'll keep going. If you want to be there for me, I'll be there for you. Now, in the what's new for Copilot. Lots happening. There are a couple that I've actually focused on, though, in the what's new, because there is there is a lot happening in the copilot space. And I know that it is a license that you do have to pay for. So I am very conscious of that. And throughout the presentation, I am talking about, you know, SharePoint Premium, and I'm talking about the Viva, you know, getting into the Viva suite as a license, whether you use it through the, you know, the communications and, um, you know, collaboration license. So I am still touching on a lot of this, but it does make it for a, a lot bigger of what's new. So in terms of the Copilot, if you have Copilot, there is the ability now to interact directly with Copilot in Outlook Classic. Classic, not the new. We were really stuck, and we've talked about it previously, and when we were talking with Adam Gernon last month, that you needed to have the Outlook new to be able to use Copilot. Now Copilot is coming into the um, Classic version along with some of the loop components and a few other things happening. And it's really interesting because when we were at MVP Summit and, you know, Heather, uh, Heather Severino and I'm sitting with her and we were kind of talking about it, it's like, here we go, we've got two playpens. 
the playpen without the fun toys in it and the playpen with all of the fun toys in it. And we want to get our babies or our kids or our employees or whatever over into the new fun playpen with all the new <laughs> features. Great. You know, it's a way to get them there. But if you put all the new fun toys into the playpen they're already in, there's no way they want to convert over to the new technology. So there's a bit of, you know, I look, I understand, you know, we were talking with Microsoft at length around Outlook and why the new Outlook and for them to really integrate with AI and the fluid components and the, it needs to modernise. It's been rebuilding from the ground up, hence why you're seeing features coming through. And they are coming fairly hard and fast and they're very conscious and you need to remember it is in, still in beta. Like it's still right back in preview. So it is not there yet. It's not out in general. It's still in early days. Lots and lots to come. So there's a lot of people going, I don't like it. It's not there yet. Look, it will eventually get there, but yeah, we'll see as it flows over. Okay. I know, I hear you, they have messed up a little, but it is getting there and it is going to continue. It will go over. So if you're not familiar with it, start having a look at it, start playing and moving between the two, I would recommend. Um, you can have both now running at the same time. You don't necessarily have to turn it off too. So I have had that. Okay. Okay. Um, will is covered. Yes, in Classic. Yes, Gemma, which is what I'm saying. It's going to be going over into Classic as well. So we'll, we'll have it actually in there too. Okay. Um, there are some accessibility highlights that are coming into play in terms of um, uh, drafting emails in the voice commands so that we can do it in Classic. There's lots of cool stuff to be able to have it flowing through. And I think that the reason I've put this in is Copilot is not just about, you know, everyday users. Copilot has really come into play to be able to help those that have got accessibility needs. And I'm seeing a lot happening to support accessibility and using Copilot. Even if you supply Copilot for those that you've identified across your business with accessibility needs, because the audio components in regards to construction and helping people and finding out how to do things and it giving voice commands on how to do something is just fabulous for accessibility. So even if you just get it for those guys to start with, highly recommended. Um, there is the new Microsoft Copilot dashboard that's actually available when it comes to some of the analytics. Now, there is a lot of this. Of course, it is underneath that more premium license to be able to see it, but there is a ton that's coming in on that dashboard. Love the dashboard. Love the analytics that's actually flowing through to be able to help and support you around your community, what they're doing, the type of prompts. Are they doing it across their applications? Where can we help and support them as adoption specialists? OK. Um, another one is in terms of the copilot, when it gets into the lab, when we get into that copilot lab and just in copilot in general. So if you're going to copilot.microsoft.com, some of the new features, there's a whole UI update. Some of the UI updates is we've got this green shield icon. It's a bit of a fly out to be able to help us around that, you know, the security around of our information. If it is a um, blue lock icon, it will then have a disclaimer in regards to it. So work content chats cannot be seen outside the organization. It's going to have these um, different little security components coming in. So there's different accuracy as well as what are your compliance standards, FAQs, privacy terms. It's bringing all these components in to be able to help and support you. There is some of those adoption materials and information available online for you. So that way we get a bit better around our governance and compliance and it's put into Copilot if they want to click on it. Okay. Now, in that big list of some of that, you know, what's new, the grounding of those copilot prompts in your content. Now, this actually means that when you have a copilot prompt and you're asking it, it's not even just looking at within the application. So if you're in Outlook or you're in Word or you're in PowerPoint, it will actually do grounding and look across the other applications to go, I also want to include the, like include 
in my email focus on you know what are the email what are the word documents i've done over the last um week so that i can maybe report this to my senior leader and you can give you a list and that's over in outlook for example so it's not just about outlook it's about outlook bringing in word or it's not just in teams it's about teams bringing in you know what are all my powerpoints or those sorts of things okay well teams is a bit more overarching because it is the prompter okay in your um, uh, Copal experience, when it comes to your mobile and as part of Teams, it's actually going to do a citation number. So this citation number means that it's going to say, where did it get the content? Because underneath what it often does as part of the recap, it will give you documents or information. It'll list them all out. Now what it's doing is it's aligning those um, summation to the actual document or whatever it actually brings up. Okay. The restrictions on SharePoint. This is one that actually came up when I was over. It was a new feature came up when I was over at MVP Summit. Now, we do particularly like this. The fact that we can actually put in um, and we can do and set up with up to 100 sites, honing in the permissions around it to go, look at this site, but not this site. Look at this site, but not this one. Eliminate all 50 sites and only focus on these four, you know, organisational intranets to pull content rather than. So you can go, it's sort of a by exception. Now it is off by default. Okay. So it is something that you would actually go in and then you can go, you know, where is it that they generally, you know, regularly visit. So it brings it in and I do like the fact that we can actually do that because there are times where we go, well, I don't want to have that SharePoint site searched at all and make sure it's put in. Okay. In the um, prompting like a pro, the new feature is the prepare for your week. So tell, show me all my meetings for the next week. Now, the one thing you need to know, it'll only bring up to 10 meetings. So if you've got a ton of meetings in the next week, at the moment it is only bringing up 10. But what I like off the back of that, the next prompt that you can actually do after that is put these into a table. Now that I love. So when you put it into a table, it gives you, here's all the meetings. This is the day that it's actually going to be on, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Is it a recurring? Is it a, you know, and the time and it puts it across a table. Go and have a play if you've got a couple. Of, I do like it. There's now this popover message coming in to help around Copilot to go, um, you might like to learn about. So organisations can kick off these prompts to go, this is how you could do something else, and it teaches them. Coming soon. Uh, now, the what's new to Teams? I think I put the audio on when I reshared. Let me just share audio. So the one thing that's actually happening, and when we saw this at MVP Summit, it was a bit of a clapping, standing ovation moment along with a couple of others, and it's now gone um, out there going live. This void... Um, uh, oh, sorry, no, that's coming. We'll come to that. Looks like the clip champ. I'll come to that one. But in this one is the voice isolation coming in. It's got a little better to remove all the voice isolation. Okay, so that's just a new feature. I'll come to the clip champ. <laughs> I'm out of uh, out of uh, out of order. The um, in terms of what's new to Teams, you're now going to have that meet now button coming in to group chat. Okay, so kick straight into a meeting, meet now. Copilot in meeting chat will now access transcripts and chat content. Because in the past, when it was doing its copilot, we'd do it just purely for meeting, but it wouldn't actually look at the chat in your meeting to go, is there anything in the chat to draw together as a summation? Or was there any questions or action items in chat? It was just literally the transcript and that's all that it looked at. The fact that we've actually now got chat included is a massive thumbs up for me because there is a lot of people that may not come off mute and they're only typing in chat. So having the convergence of the two, big thumbs up. Okay. The frosted glass background. Oh, I liked this one. I was playing around with it. So what it will do is it allows you to be able to put an image up, for example, and it does like this frosted, you know how we got the blur feature? It can do the blur feature, but it does a frosted glass, so it can still see your background, but it's all, it's um, not as blurred. And you can have, if you want to, a transparent PNG, and it will then blur your background and have your um, logo in there and part of the video effects. 
fun. When it comes to your, um, your Teams room device, a couple of things that have actually come into play and across Teams, you've got this one here, the UI improvements. We're actually now seeing not only the Teams room, but you'll have Zoom coming in there so that you can join one or the other. Some of the other features that I particularly like that's in the what's new, is the tagging. We've had tags available inside our standard channels. We've had tagging not available in our private or shared channels. That is now coming into play. Yay. Because you get, if you at mention, you can at mention an individual, you can at mention a channel, you can at mention the team, you can at mention everyone, you can at mention a tag, which is Maybe out of the 20 people, you've got three or four people that you can at mention. That way you don't have to type three or four people's name out every time. Now, it wasn't available. That is now over in private and shared, if you're not sure what that means, tags. We can archive channels. Loving the archive channels. because Sometimes we've got ones and it's pretty much a ghost town. Now you can just go archive it. Or um, I see a lot of organisations with projects and those projects, they'll have literally 100 of them in a team and they're working on different ones. And that's where they just keep all their active projects because they don't do a massive amount. It might only last for a week to, you know, a month or even two months. Now they can just archive them. Okay. We can send out links to private and shared channels coming in now. Now, what else? We can view, download and delete across when it comes to the transcript files. One of the challenges was when you say go and delete the transcript, it would, might do it in one place, but it wasn't doing it in that other place that it actually would drop it because it can often go across multiple locations. That's actually changing now. So if you go and say delete it from, it will then pull it from both. And then that way you don't have to worry about where it's still sitting because it you know, could often go across multiple locations. Uh, another cool component, we've got that gallery view in Teams. It allows you to be able to see chat a little better. Okay? And then those icons coming up in terms of being able to switch. We have the meeting options categorization coming into play. Now, this is where sensitivity labels become then that important piece. Now, it depends on what you've got turned on in your business, but now the meeting organizer is able to go in and create and say, as, as part of those meeting options, what do you want the categorization to be for this meeting if you do set it up? So I like that that's actually coming and flowing in and it can be, it, it will always still look at the standard setup that might have been done as part of sort of tree, um, Teams Premium or maybe you're using your purview, um, th th those kind of functionality. It will still look at that from an administrative perspective, but it comes down to are you allowing them to be able to sort of do it themselves? Uh, another core component is being able to pre-pin meeting apps. So now admins can actually choose in your meeting some of the apps and they can then pin them so that you can quickly, easily, as an end user, an organiser, for example, go in and use those apps inside your team meetings. Underneath the apps button, you could then come in. Intellige message translation. Now, when you receive a message and it's in another language, it will actually give you the translate button. You'll see there's a never translate as well, because what can happen is underneath the translate button, you can do your drop down and go turn on auto translation. So this means that by default, it will every time French or in Chinese or whatever it is that you actually have in there, because you can actually turn it on. For your tenants, say, I keep getting lots of messages. They are in a particular language. You can go automatically translate it for you. Okay. So this is a new feature and functionality coming into chat. Meeting details displayed now in that pre-join screen. Hallelujah. External guests aren't going to see it, but for an internal standpoint, I do like that because a lot of times people might join a little early and they're going, why am I sitting in the lobby <laughs> for so long? No. Another one is 
some of the smart components that are coming into play, kind of a bit of those graph functionality, is if you say attach, for example, it's got a quick attach functionality, so it will display the recent and contextual files that you might actually be working with to be able to help and support you. Okay. Now, it does not apply yet to mobile private channels, and it will only be for certain file types, the standard file types that we're very used to using on an everyday basis. So if you've been working on a document and it's been in um, um, you know, CAD files, for example, it's not going to bring up CAD files. Another core component, same as the, the little pop-up flyaways around education for Copilot, you're going to start seeing those same sorts of things where we can actually drive organisational messages to recommend features across um, Microsoft Teams to be able to help them learn. So the little pop-ups like you can go and use reactions. Did you know? Okay, it's a little bit of learning components that are just in time. Another feature is the sharing of call history for your delegates and delegators. So this is all about the calling functionality, so Teams phone. So you'll actually be able to see and share those record history between the two. Great for delegates. We can now, coming through very soon, track the usage for frontline teams and apps in the admin center. In the past, it was very difficult to be able to do. So we can now see the usage data for those frontline locations. And that will include things like, you know, are they using, what, is it, what does it look like for, you know, the walkie talkie using shifts and using tasks, for example, they can all then be filtered and exported as an S, a CSV. So you might want to go, we're having a particular location is really not using this why not maybe we need to up our education in that location for example or maybe they haven't had training in that location and you want to measure it before after you're for your frontline employees nice okay improvements to work hours now that work hours and location has been flowing through in terms of our um you know we had it in teams as to where you are then it was flowing through into meetings for example around you had just the the general, am I going to be in person or not? But now you're going to see it coming through in terms of Outlook at the web and, and the new release of Outlook for Windows, that whole, you know, flexible hours, uh, my, this is my work location, and you can go in and do that update to be able to plan out your day. So it's integrated in as part of your work location along with your out of office time. So people can actually see where you are and where you're going to be on a particular day as well. So you can kind of do that in advance. Teams Premium. Now, the couple of features that I particularly liked across, I mean, there is the, there's the Qs app, um, town hall supporting, the selecting languages. So some of this I've actually talked about before. Out of this, I, what I want to focus on, actually get, uh, by the way, actually, before I move on, you can, if you want to have a play around with Teams Premium, or you want to purchase it, so you can get started for 30 days. You can do a free. Okay? And if you do it before June 30, it's reducing right down to $7 per month. And that's 30% off. So it's a bit of a discount at the moment. Now let's have a look. The first thing that I wanted to touch on, manage what your attendees see. There's some enhancements around what they can actually see in that pane. So content, videos, and you can pick and choose. In terms of the intelligent call recap, it's not just about your meaning, intelligent recap now, it is flowing through for calling to be able to do intelligent call recap. So that's those calls and the one-on-one -on -one calls, new feature that's coming into play. What I, what I particularly like about that is that means you can do your own kind of meet now, or maybe you want to do a bit of um, training with one person in particular, and you want to then have that recap at the end. Okay. Sometimes I do it where it's just a meeting with myself, and you can do the recap of the meeting because I'm taking, I'd work better verbally than I do sometimes typing stuff up. Yeah. Me, <laughs> verbally, 
Anyway, <laughs> you wouldn't have guessed, right? All right. Now, organizational backgrounds. As part of Teams Premium, you can actually set your own background. So you can see this in the in the background. So it's branded to be able to support your team's meetings. These are everyday meetings with branded backgrounds. You can also have it where that invite and meeting launch can actually be branded with your logo and pictures and colors as part of Teams Premium. So if you weren't kind of sure what you why you might do Teams Premium, this is some of the stuff that's really of value when you get out in there in the community that are branded. Another one is the support for watermarking in Teams meetings so that if people go and try and do screen captures or anything like that, you can have watermarks all over your content. Configuring, record and transcribe. So this is where organisers can actually say who can do this. They can then limit it down. So admins can go who, what, how, Organisers and co-organisers, organisers, co-organisers co and presenters, because there's nothing worse than someone else potentially in the meeting kicking off recording when you don't want them to in transcript. So you can limit down who can do that as part of Teams Premium. Uh, Mark Cashman put this out recently, the history of SharePoint all the way back, kicking off to 1998. And I know that there will be some on this call that have been on that journey with SharePoint for a really, really long time. So I particularly liked this, you know, time map of where we've been from too. I probably really, really kicked in like a bit more hardcore around 2007 would probably where I started to really play around with it. But no, I would say maybe really hardcore, maybe 13 on, about 11 years. I was playing with it in seven when I was at Microsoft. Oh, hardcore. Yeah, probably from 2007. Yeah. All right. Anyway. Not that you needed to know. <laughs> I love the show. I know it's really good. Is it hills and valleys? <laughs> I don't disagree there. It's like ups and downs. Okay. Uh, yours is 2001. I know you've been doing it for quite a long time. Okay. Now, the SharePoint pit stop. Um, a lot of times the content might actually be in these um, roadmaps. I will put into various other locations, for example, like the, the Viva in search. I will kind of have that elsewhere. OK, not necessarily in here, so you might not see it off the back of some of those diagrams. Great new pieces. There is the ability in your sections when it comes to pages and news to be able to have some really nice, fun background images and gradient colours to be able to choose from now. So all these background options, I do like it. Okay, so we have some other fun theme colours coming into play. Um, now, when you send news as a post, so if it goes out into email, for example, it's not going to support those backgrounds. So when it flows actually through. Uh, okay, so embedded containers in SharePoint. When we have um, some of the APIs that get built, you know, kind of what does that mean? There are some inline business um, web parts that you can actually create. And then now as part of this, you can have them embedded into your SharePoint site. It's currently in public preview. There are some that are automatically there. There are lots that are automatically there, but one of them in particular, like is Loop. It's a SharePoint embedded application because it's an application and it's configured by default. And then you can plug that application in. So that's an application. So now there is the ability for developers to be able to leverage this and create their own and drop it into SharePoint. OK, so there's some information there. Okay. Coming, coming. Uh, uh, OK, now this is one that I, I had mixed feelings about. So in terms of SharePoint Online, it's allowing authors to be able to choose heading levels for titles and the web parts, that hierarchy. Do like that. So that's fabulous. Um, love that component. However, you know, and I understand it from an accessibility standpoint, your text web parts are also changing when it comes to things like headings. Um, you used to be able to do sort of, you know, the 28 words, it's now 24 and the 24 for level three is now 20, 20 is now 18. It's coming in line with other accessibility improvements. But, you know, sometimes it's hard even with the length that you get to get uh, sometimes some of the longer headings in, you now got less. I know, right? 
Hmm. Mixed feelings on it. I get it, but still mixed feelings. Now, uh, okay, so searching from that tenant root site, if uh, in the past, in terms of the search, there were some issues in terms of where it would do its search, and then it wouldn't actually do a lot of the times from the root site. If you had a hub, for example, so you had a hub and you went and searched in the hub, it would automatically be connecting for the root for all the sites underneath it because it's kind of your root site. Um, but now by you know default, it's going go search right from the root site all the way through. Okay, so it's a little different where it used to just kind of look underneath just that site. So now it's kind of going a little bit bigger. Okay, you can do some configuration around that if you do need to, but that's kind of what it's looking at now okay? from the root. One of the other components is to be able to enable and, and disable when it comes to unstructured, structured and pre-built documents. Now, this is all that classification of files. So if you're working across um, Purview and it's flowing then into your SharePoint Premium, um, it will actually help you to then do some classification of documents such as contracts, for example. So it's looking at different ways that it's going to process some of them individually. With another piece on SharePoint Premium is when you go and create, so say you go and create a new library, a new document library. So in your drop down, you might have multiple different document libraries. So when you create that new document library, what will happen, a new feature that's coming into play is this context query. So you can then go search across both both of those libraries or just within that library. So it gives you a bit of a query search functionality. So it gives you more column metadata kind of searching. Now the new to OneDrive, this is kind of this and this, they're joined together, these two pages. So let's, let's come back. There was a video that's just recently gone out. It's the sync up episode. So OneDrive do a regular um, monthly call and in there they're interviewing and talking with. It's um, you can just watch it through the site like, or you can just listen to the podcast or if you click on the YouTube, it will take you to the YouTube where you can physically see them chatting and talking. So it depends on which way you go. Now, when you get in there, one of the things that I particularly liked was it was talking about the new create.microsoft.com. And if you haven't been there, highly recommend. It's all of the templates that, you know, you go into PowerPoint and you go file new and it's got the templates. Now, we always kind of had a the templates place to go when it came to Microsoft, but this is all new in terms of its design. So it's been kind of rebuilt with the create site because now that we've got some great content and things flowing through from Microsoft Designer and Loop, and ClipChamp, it's bringing it all together. So it's now that one-stop hub for all things templates across Microsoft 365 around creation. Now, if you're not receiving it, I would recommend OneDrive actually have a newsletter that they put out on some of this content of what's new, because there's a lot that's happening across the OneDrive space and even more to come. Okay. So that create piece where it's flowing through into OneDrive. Now what happens is when you want to create a new, so if you're going to create a new, you can go and it's coming in to be able to create with templates. In that creation, it goes, which ones would you like to actually new? So the add new button, and it gives you the option of a new blank file. Here's all the templates to be able to jumpstart you in getting your work done. Now in here, you can also have then those company templates that you can work with and upload into files and folders. And so that's all flowing in. As well in OneDrive, there's some new file capabilities in the viewer that are coming into play. There's a lot more performance enhancements when it comes to your online version, for example. There is the people view. So when you go into OneDrive, there's more happening across the people view, um, the favorites view, being able to open in app, um, uh, merging in terms of PDFs, the annotations, for example, and e-signatures are all coming into those new capabilities for just the file viewer. So this is the file viewer version. Okay, when you're in OneDrive online, file viewer, not I've opened the document and it's over in 
wherever in you know Word or PowerPoint or everything. So these are new features coming into play. So you can use Copilot through here and okay. Media node. Now, and you may not, it's very small and it's really blurred. I couldn't get a higher picture for you. I did do a bit of a search. We had previously the, you know, browse by people, browse by meetings in OneDrive. A new one is the media node. So we had the people node, we had the meeting node. Now we got the media node. And it is actually bringing together all of your media in, into one single view in OneDrive. I love it. So now from that one node, like you can on the people or the meetings, you can actually perform different actions such as share and download and delete, bringing all that photo content into one space. You know, we we, we saw it, especially in the, like if you have your um, OneDrive, you know, personal and on your mobile phone, it was great. You know, you can do some of that stuff, but it's now flowing through into OneDrive. And it's, this is through the web, by the way. Um, keep an eye out because there's all sorts of great features and functionality coming down for OneDrive. We'll be talking about them. Um, I loved what's going on in the OneDrive space when I was at MVP Summit. Um, and we get to pull, you know, the thing about MVP Summit, we get to pull things apart. We have plenty of implosion and explosions where it's kind of going, that's cool. Hang on. What are you doing? <laughs> but that's why we go and we pull it apart. Okay. What's new to lists? Now, I have touched on this previously. The fact that forms is coming into play in lists, so a forms component going over the top of lists. There is coming up a call around this experience. It's being done through the Power Platform community. You're free to actually join and go along. Um, I, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more. If you haven't actually watched the video, I have embedded the video so you can watch You know what's going on in terms of that new experience. Uh, a couple of things to actually note in regards to the experience. You can only share the the form as a link and it's inside your organization okay so you cannot share the form with lots of different permissions it's just kind of one one link at this point okay it is not available for necessarily external members at this point um it will not appear um on um, lists or sites when that you, when you don't allow that sharing link for your organizational members so it depends on how you've set it up and sharing out and with the organizational members and where it's going to come there's there's lots happening across that particular space um i would recommend going and having a look we'll kick in okay add approvals to any sharepoint list any sharepoint list okay so that is now coming into play so they've expanded that ability to be able to enable or disable um, those approvals on any list they can configure it they've got the automate drop down here to be able to do that if you disable approvals it all it's going to do is hide certain relevant columns but it still can be actionable across teams okay so you can manually add approval columns back into the view um so it's, it's a new component coming through in loop a new feature that's actually flowing into loop is the ability for each row inside your loop table and the cards you can actually show additional information so you'll see this little button here it's like the little arrow show additional information underneath that additional information you can then start to put in your additional information so that it will show up on your progress tracker Okay, so let that little button open for more detailed views. So that's a additional information piece off the back of a tracker for loops, tables and boards. You don't have to fill it in, but it's there and available for you. Loop, you have now business to business guest sharing. So that's that B2B guest sharing for loop. Sensitivity labels will still apply to those spaces. So you can then collaborate with guests. Now, project slash planner. There are a few things that are coming into play across this space. So the whole project online version is actually renamed as completely like planner. Okay, so the web version is no longer kind of the web version anymore. It's the planner version for project. Um, 
so it'll be you'll see it renaming to planner one of the features and functionality that's actually coming in as part of that sort of project for the web is you can now access and edit the same set of capabilities for project that you have in planner because one of the difficulties was with planner you had to have a project license to be able to do some of these features and functionality. That is not going to be the case anymore. And with the rename of and coming up of Project for the Web and the integration of Planner, this means that the average user, if you've got the license to go with it, are going to be able to update these sorts of fields as part of that subscription service. Okay. The new planner in Teams is now in public preview. So you can go and have a bit of a play. Look at the demos, the website, the adoption website. I've got lots more content that's come into play around it um, and, and go and have a look. Another feature in terms of planner is the ability to then upgrade a basic plan to the premium plan. There are new plans to be able to do things like you know move tasks from my day to my tasks to plans and you can move things around um, ability to be able to see your premium tasks over in my tasks it's in preview at the moment and all these different bug fixes that are coming through so that's in that new planner in the what's new to forms some of this we've talked about previously. We've talked about the forms data sync, um, being able to do practice mode, um, the forms app on your desktop. If you haven't actually downloaded, I do like the forms app, but you can't use it offline. So a bit of a note there. The one thing, so say you've got like this one's here's a Christmas. You know how you often have the number one, two, three, four, five, six, and all the way down? You can actually remove that. So that's a new feature. So you can disable those question numbers and make it seem a little bit less formal with having it taken out. There's the new Google Forms um, migration. And I do like the pre-fill link. So this little video, what it actually means, it took me a moment to kind of you know, work out what was going on. And it just means that if you've got a form, you can actually pre-fill it with some of the content already so that they don't have to fill it in. If you know that you're about to send that link to a particular group of people, you might pre-fill it with their information that this is a standard role with this, this, and they can then see it as a, a bit of a pre-fill some of the forms. Okay. And you get a link, a pre-fill link goes out. Okay. Now, this is the one I was talking about. It was a bit of a stand-up moment that we just love. It was a really simple little thing in terms of ClipChamp, but I liked it. It will automatically find and delete for you unwanted silences and pauses. Now, they have to be more than three seconds long. So if you're sitting there and you stop, then you're thinking, you're going, what's next? It can be a long pause in your video. So now you can go into ClipChamp and it will auto detect and remove as part of the ClipChamp premium subscription, those longer pauses. I do like that. Okay. So you might find you don't need a premium subscription for everyone. It's just those that who are um, um, using, you know, ClipChamp that create content, maybe your trainers and your comms team and, okay. Another uh, core component, trying to find some of the what's new to ClipChamp. There is actually a blog on the ClipChamp site. We can go and see what's physically coming through. So you can see here, there's that silence remover. Lots of great new stock um, music has come into play. Uh, yeah, go, go have a look at what's happening across there. Now, in Beaver Engage, articles now available. It's no longer in preview across Viva Engage. That way you can do custom quite long articles as a capability to be able to push it out there for your communications piece and have it look like an actual article rather than just a post. Okay? I do like it. As part of Viva Engage Premium, 
Copilot and that whole AI summarization, summarization coming into play for Viva Engage. Now, of course, this always depends on whether you've got the licenses, for example, but it allows you to be able to go in and help around writing those posts. So it can do suggestions for you, can do summarizations for you, what's happened across, you know, Viva Engage whilst I've been on leave for the last two weeks. It'll do a summary. And um, those are the things that I do like. OK, um, so it is in preview at the moment and it is coming. There has been some navigation enhancements. They were conscious and it's been reported that there were some inconsistencies across the various environments, depending on where you went. So if you're over now and you're in Teams, they're trying to make sure that everything kind of comes into alignment and it actually looks the same from one to the next to the next to reduce down some confusion. Okay. Ah, answers. Now, we're probably going to talk about this a little bit more next month. There is an importer, so it means you can import answers based on documents. Now, it has to be particular file types, so it has to be a DOCX, um, PDS, or a TXT file type from your, you know, local kind of, you know, that Word document type thing where you can import questions and answers. Maybe you ran a session in Teams and you, you know, you did a Q&A and you've pulled all those Q&A down and you've already answered them. You can now import that in. Aviva, I'm loving that. I don't know how many times, how many times have you got even a, a site, you got your FAQ site and you might want to put those FAQs and convert over and have it over in your answers even as well. So these are the things I do like. Okay. Now, um, there are some limitations. It's a hard limit of five megabytes for each document. So you have to keep it somewhat smaller, two to 10 pages and a limit of, you know, 20 in any given upload. There is some advanced insights in terms of the Copilot dashboards. So those private, it's just currently in private preview and adoption by a particular group of individuals. We've also got the ability to be able to view those Power BI templates over in the Insights web app. So you can go, you know, um, and what's actually going on in Power BI for those templates. There is now a delegate access for leaders. So they might have their insights in regards to the organisation. They can actually share those insights now out with leaders. They can only delegate though to those that have got Viva Insights subscription. They can do it to multiple people. They can't do them to externals. They can revoke them. Okay. So these are all things that can be done. Okay. One of the things, and I've heard this too, when it comes to Viva Learning, by default, premium content in the past, people could actually see when they'd go to play it and then couldn't see it, says you need to have a premium license to watch this content, basically. So now what you can do as part of Viva Learning, you can actually, because it's turned on by default, you can actually go in now and say, I don't want to have the premium content surfacing for my users in my Viva learning environment now. So that is coming out soon. And I know that there's a lot of organisations that don't subscribe to the premium content, and there are plenty that do, so that is changing. There is some new language settings coming in in terms of Viva Learning to be able to reflect their native language. So it is available in other languages. So you can go in and as an admin, you can preset what that language actually looks like for an individual. Now, they can go into their own and say they might want something different, but it can be done from a higher level as a default. In the Viva Learning app, up the very top, you can now come in and as part of this, you can go show it in Teams and or if you're in Teams, show me the web app. A quick link to be able to go to and switch between the environments. 
just a little interface. Now, the thing is, the problem with all of these little interface changes, if you've got screenshots in your training material, <laughs> you need to do some updates on your pictures. <laughs> like everything, it always happens every single month, you know, trying to keep up with it. I just say just use the Microsoft content wherever you can rather than building out and or do your demos live and not build death by PowerPoint because it just moves so fast, guys. All right. Viva Connections. There are some advanced analytics now coming to Viva Connections. Yay, we get the 90 day, you know, data. So um, finally having some of that more advanced and then the monthly data for the last 12 months. So that is great to be able to see that advanced analytics coming through for Viva Connections. The other component is if you have more than one connections experience, because sometimes we've got you know, multiple um, organizations and it's based on a tenant level, you can actually go do Viva Connections and it'll be available um, across the whole of connections for both rather than just at a tenant. You can have it where you're in the tenant and it will do, but it will go across the two, okay? Um, it won't It won't change for those that have only got one environment. So it depends on if you've got more than one tenant and connecting merging of businesses for example dark mode will be supported for viva connections in teams so if you use dark mode connections is coming into play and the other component is coming over to the ios and android when it comes to your tablets you're going to be able to search the internets across your viva connection space and the app in teams this newer url last month i did talk about all of the url changes so viva goals has now come into play so if you've got a screenshot or you're saying go to goals dot or you know the, the the old url it's actually changed now you'll need to put in a new link if you're teaching them um the viva pulse if you wish to have a look at viva pulse they're currently offering a 25 user for 30 day trial to have a little bit of a look at Viva Pulse. So that is now coming into play. There are some resources there if you want to go in and have a look at it, work with your team. Okay. Outlook for the new Outlook. Now we've touched on the new Outlook. What's coming? It's going to take a while till the new Outlook becomes the you know, Outlook for Windows or Outlook Monarch, as we've been calling it, it will take a while for that to actually flow through. So into the new, we're still very early days. But this is what they're actually looking at in terms of that um, uh, my, bit of the migration path and what's going to happen over a period of time. So you'll get plenty of notice. What's coming one of the features is the um, copy email attachment is coming. Um, it's, it's, it needs the I, um, easier to be able to send longer emails and put them in as attachments, for example. So you can use that copy and paste into a thread. You won't be able to do it if it is marked not forwardable. So if you've put that in as a you know feature a classification compliance, then you can't do it, okay? On mobile, now this depends in terms of what admin have actually put in their Intune policies. So if it has got uh, the, you can't do the, you know, preventing of copying and pasting of data in an out of contact editor, you know, it will enforce that now flowing through into the contact piece. The good part is as part of the contact card inside the business, it does mean that users can edit and create and manage from their mobile phone. And when it comes to that syncing between the two and keeping things up to date, but it always will depend on what your policies are. To do integration is now coming because we've seen it in Outlook Classic where it's got the to do your tick in Outlook whether it's the um, um, Monarch version or the classic version, it is now coming to mobile as well. So you can go to that apps in that navigation bar as part of your Outlook and you'll be able to go to do from there. So it can, and then you can pin it as well. Okay. In a chat for the meeting, you'll be able to, so in the meeting invite, say on your Outlook mobile, you'll be able to do the chat with your participants directly from that calendar invite on your mobile. There are some new formatting options for Word on the web. I particularly like this because there were some um, 
some real struggles when it came to some of the formatting on the web version of Word, being able to do things like put it into a column. You had to open it to your desktop to do something as simple. simple. Um, your line numbering. And another one is getting into our headers and footers. Yay. <laughs> I know, word for the web, there were core cool components that have been asked for for a really long time. In Excel, Excel, we can now export from the web to a CSV. Yay. Okay, there's, there's a lot of applications that want things as a CSV, so you can now download it as a CSV if you wish to. Okay. So that's one of the core components. There are other ones. There is um, Power BI connected tables, um, showing details in pivot tables. So there's a you know some of the detail space and then some of the scripting coming into play. There for PowerPoint on the web, in terms of what's coming, you'll find this underneath the um, uh, insiders. So on the insiders, there is all this great features and functionality coming to PowerPoint for the web. The animation pane is now coming into play. And off the back of that animation pane, you can actually drag content up and down and work with your animation. Hallelujah. Like it. I don't know. Sticky notes. There is a new sticky notes that's coming in. It's part of the OneNote. It is available in the OneNote app in preview at the moment for the window. So the two are kind of coming together. It's built on the foundation of OneNote for you to be able to do notes. I've been I've been using and playing with it a bit. Um, I do love it. I use it because I've got all my co-piling prompts for when I'm training. I've kind of have it in my sticky notes and that then also flows into my one notes. There's a bit of a new experience around sticky notes. Retiring, don't forget your stream classic is going to retire. This morning, I finally did the migration of my videos. I've left it kind of to the last minute, but I did it. It's actually quite a simple admin process. Um, it will need to be done from an administrator unless you're wanting to go in and, you know, doing some drag and drops from SharePoint, which we don't want to do. Admin can do it. It does a search across, so it does a search. It Then you tick where you might want it to go and then do the migration. It's, it's not too hard. It might be timely in terms of where you want things to come go. Um, it does take a little while to do a bit of a search and find all of the videos, uh, but it's a um, it's a good process. Okay. Another one is the ad registrations to a meeting feature is being deprecated because there is the new webinar create experience. Another one is the out of office. So if you are using out of office, one of the components is when I have that out of office on, then it's sort of changing my uh, um, um, voicemail. Okay? That was one of the features around voicemail. That is actually being retired. You still will have the all the time. And when I have Outlook auto reply on, that it will kick in your voicemail for um, calling. It's just not going to have this out of office calendar event anymore. I always look in the release notes. There's lots coming up. The Digital Workplace Conference is actually coming up very soon. It's going to be held in Sydney. It was in Melbourne last year in August. It's going to be um, in end of July, August this year in Sydney. So you'll be able to go in and get your tickets in terms of some early registration. Looking forward to that and all the speakers and I have to fly even better. Um, the If you're wanting to be a speaker, if there's anyone on the call that wants to be a speaker, then you can actually, uh, tomorrow I think is the, deadline to get your speaker submission in. Mm, haven't done it yet. <laughs> I'll be a bit of a last minute one. We'll see. Um, in the events catalog, some great content in the events catalog, especially around um, M365. So a lot of this is live, but they will have sort of the recordings and information after the event. The M365 conference is about to kick off so much content that's going to be. It is being held in um, Orlando, Florida, if you want to go. There's lots on the community days. You'll see you've got the, you know, digital workplace conferences all over the world. If you're traveling, maybe you want to look one up. 
there's I'm not going to go through the resource links. I have been doing an update to this content and making sure that it's all relevant. I went right through it this month, pulled one or two things out, put one or two things in in terms of some of the places that I'm actually going, by the way. All the user groups, there is the GitHub available to be able to find them as well if you're looking it up. I'll always put my past content in there. I will pull, go and have a um, double check of the presentation in the recording. So I'll I'll make sure that you've got that there. Um, what's next? Ah, next month. I did say I'd come around to this. Viva Answers is going to be spoken about in a deep dive with James Tyre. So I'm really looking forward to James coming back. He last spoke with us when um, uh, part of the whole Viva Engage was you know some of the changes that was being looked at back when this was august 2022 was the last time he came in and chat so i'm really looking forward to him helping us understand a bit more about answers and what's happening there and the month after that we are going to be having swoop i'll have all of these going live fairly soon we'll have swoop coming in to talk to their latest research around sharepoint and what that actually looks like from an analytics and what, what they found okay and some of the eggs. So that is everything for the month. I did say that, you know, we'd probably be going over a lot <laughs> this month. For those that actually stayed in, um, I do appreciate it. We, um, I, I would much prefer to have our speakers with us and um, for a little longer and answering questions, especially when they bring the value that you know Caruana and Heather do for those that did stay thank you very much for staying and uh you know until we hit our hit our next month how many we still we still got 10 I'm, I'm amazed I thought maybe we'd we'd lose more <laughs> at the end um thank you all for coming along appreciate it and if you have any questions I'm more than happy to Shari yes the call for speakers is out there for the power platform conference um anything else uh, mm -mm. Is there anything in here as a question? Looks like everything has been pretty much answered. Having a look, see, just in case. It was a marathon session. There was lots happening this month and, uh, lo you know, lots of talking. I'll go have some water because I haven't been drinking my water. <laughs> Thank you for joining. Um, don't forget the recording, although it might drop into um, here, what I would like to say is it is on YouTube that you are going to access that particular meeting recording. Um, the presentation link is pinned up the top. I'll bring it back again. Let me go get it again here we go the 2024 presentation let me just copy and paste so this and if you even paul if you even put in and swap out april and put in um feb feb march even mar it's mar i think 24 um, presentation, I will go and grab it from the previous session for you right now so that you've actually got it as well for last month. And I'll drop it in and I will make sure that I update as well the um, uh, link on YouTube. wasn't aware that it wasn't working. Here we go. Let me just drop the link in for the March presentation as well for you. Oh, it's very big, but uh, I'm yelling at you. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for joining. We'll go for now. Please feel free to stay and chat with me if you like. I am going to turn off the recording now. Okay. So that took long.